Uh, this is a um, public meeting, and so the rules of the public comment are the City Commission values and relies on the input from our fellow citizens. Um, if you can approach the podium, speak directly to the commission and not to individual commissioners. Um, you have three minutes and a timer to keep track of your time. And remember, at 7.30, we are going to have a city commission meeting of which we will reopen public comment at that time. So if you want to speak once, speak twice, um, come on up. So uh, anyone here to speak tonight at, uh, related to this special meeting? All right. We'll close public comment. Bring the meeting back up to this side of the table. And I guess I will kick this off with either Mr. Johnson or Ms. Rudd. Well, the report came from Ms. Rudd, so I'm going to defer to her. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and City Commissioners. Um, what I put together in the um, uh, commission letter, I'll just take a couple minutes and... Uh, Um, I'll just take a couple of minutes and briefly go over the commission letter. Um, just uh, as a refresher, the uh, City Commission's current general fund, fund balance policy is to have at least 10% of budgeted expenditures, but no more than 25% of budgeted expenditures. Um, I've included some excerpts from the um, Government Finance Officers Association um, guidelines for fund balance policies. And um, just quickly, um, the GFOA recommends uh, the general purpose government uh, maintain unrestricted budgetary fund balance um, in the general fund of no less than two months or approximately 18% um, of either operating revenue or um, general fund operating expenditures, whichever you find is more appropriate for your community. Um, specifically, they mention um, you should consider, or they recommend considering uh, predictability of your revenues, volatility of your expenditures, also one-time outlays, um, also um, the drain on the general fund from your other funds, and um, also the potential impact of uh, bond ratings, meaning uh, the lower your um, bond rating, um, usually uh, the more in interest you pay. Um, recently, it's, it's roughly been about um, 15 basis points per grade in a bond rating. Um, that can vary, though, depending. Um, that's just the current uh, spread. Um, also, it um, recommends that you um, not necessarily use the um, unrestricted um, to look at unassigned fund balance as well, and that's what we do. Our, word, our wording is um, unassigned fund balance. And what that is is the difference between uh, the unrestricted and unassigned is unrestricted is really, um, just to summarize it, um, really by accounting standards and legally what's restricted um, or what's um, maybe owing or dedicated. And then the unassigned is another layer that we put on that we're allowed uh, to add. And we do that by way of um, the city commission has authorized me to assign things in fund balance. And we um, right now, what we assign are vacation, future vacation bank and um, sick bank payouts for people um, that are eligible to retire because we really can't control that. So that's something that could hit us at any time. When people are eligible, they could um, commence retirement. So, um, so that's really what we assign at this time. So our policy is we look at unassigned fund balance rather than unrestricted fund balance for our policy. So um, just a few things that um, um, I put on here for the commission's consideration when um, discussing uh, the current policy is to keep in mind that um, um, after the public safety millage passed, uh, we created a public safety fund. And so what we do is we put the, um, all the expenditures and all the revenues that are allocated to public safety in a separate fund. Um, we do this so we can show people that those, that new millage is not going in the general fund and we are spending it for public safety. Although it is a minority, that millage is a minority, um, about 
nine and a half million of the $30 million budget, we still do it. We're not required to do that. But since the uh, public safety is a function of the general fund historically, um, we put that table in the budget. So um, we look at them combined still. So that's why we show a, a general fund, fund balance in the projections and also um, general fund combined with public safety. So I um, would like you to keep that in mind as well. Um, the, um, the other thing to keep in mind is um, like the GFOA um, recommended to avoid the risk of placing too much emphasis um, at one point in time. So if you notice in the forecast that the combined fund balance for public safety and the general fund um, are estimated to decline to 18% by 2022-23 which is the end of our forecast. Um, also uh, to consider is we do have a policy right now um, that we have a minimum bond rating of um, um, AA negative. Um, we are above that. We are AA plus with S&P and we are AA with Fitch. Um, I would like to point out that um, in the latest bond rating that we had this spring, um, Fitch um, wrote that the um, higher fund balance of the general fund helped to close the gap on the low score the city received for its statutory limitations related to the inability to increase uh, tax assessment, as well as um, it helped out the low score from the revenue frame, framework, was, which was actually uh, rated triple B, which is very poor. So our um, fund balance level that we had um, was very favorable to help our bond rating. And then um, S&P also reported that the general fund balance is very strong, which helped to increase the average fiscal score as weak scores were received in the operating deficit and the debt liability criteria, because we have increased our legal debt limit, um, excuse me, our legal debt relative to our limits significantly. Um, and then just real quick, a couple of other things. Um, also to keep in mind that um, we are levying our uh, heli max on all of our millages. So that um, doesn't allow too much flexibility or the ability to raise rates um, quickly um, in, in the event of a negative fiscal situation. And um, also the city could consider itself somewhat vulnerable because Many of our millages are um, not permanent, and they're, um, they're, uh, there's a need for renewals periodically, and that would be one of our refuse, our roads, our public safety, and our library millage. Um, in addition, um, some might consider the state shared revenue rep that we receive as um, very vulnerable. It has, in the past at least, uh, um, shown to be vulnerable. Um, in addition, our interest income has been, uh, has fluctuated significantly. Um, there is a graph, I believe, in the budget that shows that, um, you know, we went from receiving a million and a half in income interest um, to help supplement our operating expenses to as low as $300,000. That's a significant fluctuation, and that's, just, that's an annual amount. And then um, also just real quickly, um, when we do have sufficient fund balances, I've been able to um, use those money to assist residents who have a, um, like a road special assessment program when the city engineer needs about one hundred dollars or $200,000. We don't have to go out and bond for that, which is very expensive um, because there are some fixed costs in bonding that are put on the residents. So that's, that's a very nice convenience to have. And then... Um, really important, the state of Michigan recently passed some legislation that is requiring that we use their stated assumptions for calculations for reporting to them. So um, on some uh, pension and OPEB, on our pension and OPEB trusts, and last week they finally came out with their um, draft assumptions, and they're much more conservative than our assumptions. So if the pension and retiree health care boards decide to adopt those as their assumptions or some of those as their assumptions, our contributions will increase. So um, that's a consideration. Um, 
and our required contributions for the um, pension and recommended, their recommended contributions for the health care. And then um, just finally, um, the GFOA, again, recommends that uh, no less than um, two months um, be used for um, a fund balance level. So that's, that's all my comments. So Questions from Ms. Rudd? Commissioner Dubuck. Um, yeah, so I think the considerations are <clears throat> clear here, and uh, given that you have a recommendation from the association that a bare minimum is 18%, given some of our circumstances, I think it's there's a clear case as to why we should be above that. What I'm not seeing in your letter is what is staff's thinking as to the 25%, should it be higher, is the 25% accurate in your estimation, given the considerations that you've laid out? Um, we've been there for a while. Uh, we have voted to overrule it several times on staff's recommendation. So, I mean, do you, does Mr. Johnson have a number with, uh, you know, kind of a rationale as to where we should be? What would be our best practice given these considerations? Um, that's difficult to answer. I will say this. Um, it's been apparent to me that the commission, to, to have the flexibility that the commission has been able to have because of the fund balance, we've had some significant outlays that really weren't thought of three years ago, okay, with the city hall and stuff. Um, you know, that's nice to have. Um, this commission um, uh, is very flexible, um, move is dynamic, and moves as uh, is necessary. And if that happens, um, it's nice to have, um, you know, a fund balance like that. So if that continues uh, and that flexibility is needed, um, a higher fund balance would be required, I would say. Um, you know, we just, uh, you know, we paid out a significant amount this year, and two years ago, we weren't even, we weren't even looking at that. So, uh, you know, it was one of those one-time um, outlays. So, um, I mean, just considering that, does the, does the commission feel that they want to remain at double AA, A, double A plus, or would they be willing to? We would we would have to change that policy. Understood. Yeah. I guess what I'm saying is I get the considerations. I, I'm 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 following you. I think, uh, you know, having a little bit of insurance in case one of our millages goes down and we need to float a year to then retool that millage, put a new question on the ballot that that uh, the community finds more acceptable. We need to be able to survive that year. So we want that, we want to maintain our, our bond rating. Uh, there's value in being able to float upfront costs for municipal works projects instead of bonding out for those. I follow all that. What I'm saying is, so is 30% the number? Because I want to have a number and I want to stick to it so that we understand exactly what we should be budgeting and, and if there's extra dollars in the budget, we have a conversation about what we want to use those dollars on. So, I mean, is the, is, 25% the number is 30% the number. Clearly 18% is the hard deck recommended. I think given our circumstances you've laid out, that's far too low for us. Does staff have a view to what is an acceptable number that we would, budgeting going forward, be comfortable sticking to so that we can say, all right, we've hit that. Now we're either going to roll back mills or we're going to invest dollars into public works. Any answer from staff? Because that's what I'm looking. I don't want to pick a number out of a vacuum. I don't, I don't want to make. I don't want to make it up. I want to. I want to make an informed decision about: Are we at the right place? Do we need to change this rule? If we don't need to change this rule, and twenty five percent is right, then we do have to have a conversation about the cash that we have above and beyond the twenty five percent right now. But what you also have to look at is the forecast. Correct. If you want to go along the lines of the GFOA uh, guidelines, you don't look at just this year. You know, where are we going? So, and, and that does demonstrate um, uh, a decline down to 18%. You definitely want to look oh. multi-year and long-term. Agreed. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of my perspective on this one. When I came here originally in 2005, uh, I got here after the budget had been adopted. The 2005-06 budget called for using all fund balance 
in the general fund and also taking basically all of the fund balance from the enterprise funds uh, that, that actually had a fund balance. Uh, took everything that was in the farmer's market fund, took everything that was in the recreation fund, and I think there was one other one that it was robbing as well. Uh, and that's how they managed to balance the one-year budget. It was the first year that the city did any kind of multi-year budgeting. They actually looked at two years, and they were projecting a $6.4 million deficit for the following year. And no fund balance anywhere to grab uh, to help make that up. Uh, things turned out to not be that bad. Uh, we managed to get through it. We made a lot of reductions, but uh, we've built up the balance gradually over many years. Uh, we've also funded a lot of things that weren't funded before. Uh, in 2005, uh, we didn't have a penny into uh, retiree health care, which is fully funded today. Uh, and even prior to the bond issue, we had been funding on an actuarial basis for several years. Uh, the required contributions. Uh, in 2005, it was zero. Uh, I'm very, very cautious about reducing fund balance. I don't think we should be deliberately trying to do that. I think we should, uh, my feeling is the higher that is, the better, the safer we are, the more flexibility we have, and the less chance that we're going to find ourselves in a, in a bad position. Uh, and as Julie has pointed out numerous times, our revenues are not real solid. Our revenues are very subject. Uh, they have to be renewed. Uh, we've only got one tax levy that's, that's kind of guaranteed. Uh, everything else is a voter-approved extra levy. Uh, and at any one, any time, uh, one of those could fail. And what are you going to do if one of those fail? Uh, you could be back in the position that they were in 2004, 2005 with the library, uh, at which time, if you recall, the commission had voted basically to close the library down until the library millage was approved. The commission only budgeted for half a year's operation of the library prior to that millage being approved. Uh, I can't speak to any of the conversations that went on on that one because that all predates me. Uh, but. That was a situation, it had just occurred just before I got here. Uh, the millage had been approved and the project to renovate the library was going on. Uh, we're very, very dependent on the public safety levy, uh, which is, is funding. Certainly not all, but a, a great, a significant amount of police, fire, and emergency medical services. Uh, the Highway levy is not one that I necessarily anticipated we would necessarily be going back to renew. It really depends on what our situation is at the, at the time and whether we want to continue making improvements. Uh, but that millage is very much just linked to improvement projects, not to ongoing maintenance. So if we were to lose that one, we could continue with our ongoing maintenance at about the level that we were doing before uh, we had that millage. We would just not be doing any new road work, no major reconstructions uh, at all. Uh, solid waste has been very solid as far as public support is concerned. Uh, in fact, it's, it's more popularly known as the recycling levy. Uh, but legally it's the solid waste levy. Uh, that's one that we have at times reduced uh, and not levied the whole thing. Uh, we did levy the full amount last time because of the, uh, the new containers, uh, but we've been having discussions about more new containers to actually to go to a containerized uh, supplied by the city for the uh, refuse as well as the uh, recycling. Uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is that it would be a major help with the rat issue. Uh, but you know, if we do that and we supply the containers, it's an expensive proposition. Uh, getting back to general fund, which is what we're really concerned about here, uh, 
you know, at the time that the 10 to 25 was established, we were very, very concerned about being able to meet the 10. Uh, and, and hadn't always met the 10. Uh, I don't remember even giving, I know Mr. Miller said that he thought about the 25, but at the time I didn't think much about the 25 because it almost seemed unreachable. Uh, but we have reached it. Uh, 25 is really only three months operations. You know, it sounds like a lot when you say 25%. It sounds like very little when you say three months. Uh, but you, you need to think about it in those terms. And you also need to think in terms of even in ongoing operations, you need a significant fund balance just to carry you over from the beginning of the fiscal year and to the point where you've actually collected significant amounts of your taxes. Because, you know, we, we levy at the beginning of July, but we don't necessarily collect it all immediately. And we have expenditures. You know, we have employees to pay from the very beginning of the month. Um, so I don't have one number that I'd like to give you, but I'd like to either just continue this discussion, uh, maybe come to terms with a number, or it, just come to the conclusion that we're going to look at this on a long-term basis and that we aren't going to base it all on what occurs in one fiscal year. There's a few things that I think are important in determining what is the, uh, the, the correct amount for a, a fund balance maximum. Uh, and and I, I think of the fund balance as basically a rainy day fund. Uh, yes. It could be used for emergency surprise expenses that come up or it could be uh, you're holding back funds for an anticipated large project at some point. But, but I see it mainly as a rainy day fund, and I, I presume that's the way you're looking at it as, as well, Ms. Rudd. Yeah. All right. Now, with that said, we, we do have some experience from the Great Recession as to how our revenues fluctuated. Now, are you able to give us some insights from, from that time as to what we could expect if we happened upon a similar occurrence? Um, in regard to maybe state shared revenue or well, tax I, revenue? I, I guess it's, it's, there's two ways. I mean, number one is to, is to look at the uh, reduction in taxable value and, 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 and what we might see from a, a tax revenue standpoint reduction. I mean, I'm just taking a quick glance at the history here. It looks like about a 10% cut in taxable value uh, during the, the Great Recession is, is what I'm seeing. Uh, so that would be one aspect. The other aspect would be uh, uh, the uh, uh, type of cuts we might expect in uh, in, uh, in revenue sharing from the state of Michigan, uh, you know, based upon the experience we had during the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I believe I think we have a graph in here that illustrates um, the loss in the state shared revenue, but um, I mean annually mil a couple million dollars um, that we've lost in the um, the annual payment there now relative to what that's not from the Great Recession that's dating back to about 2000 2001 or so mm-hmm thank mm -hmm. you yeah. Stage 51. thank you it's state yeah. revenue you're talking about state Are we able to go past 7.30 or? I think we can go five minutes past uh, 7.30. Okay. I think Mr. Gilliam, if that's all right. We can take as much time as we need. We're in a special meeting right now. So, yeah. okay. so ladies and gentlemen, for those of you that just arrived, we're actually still um, conducting our special meeting related to fund balance. But I'm <coughs> at the privilege of this commission, we may just extend it just a few more minutes as opposed to having a you know, additional meeting. Uh, immediately so Commissioner Macy okay I have some questions first um, what was the bond rating recommendation the recommendation coming out of the state you said that recommendations have changed they're now more conservative for our for our, there's nobody I guess for OPEB I guess was what it was for yes for OPEB you said there were draft recommendations for the OPEB that were more conservative than what were the assumptions that we're using right now what were those recommendations um, I, I think I brought those um, Okay. 
right now, um, their investment rate of return is 7%. Mm -hmm. Ours is 7 and 3 quarter. Um, their salary increase is 3.75%. Ours is 3. Um, they've changed the mortality table. Um, I'm not quite sure on the, the mortality table. Um, Health care inflation, um, they have at 8.5% and then 4.5% long term. Uh, the 8.5 is um, maybe like years one through three, they don't specify, but, but the long, uh, long term is 4.5. I believe ours is nine and three. And then um, amortization period, um, their max on the pension system is 20 years. And I believe police and fire right now, we're amortizing over 26. So that'll shorten that police and fire up. Okay, thank you. Um, and you mentioned that our, our bond rating is likely to suffer if we have a less robust general uh, fund than we do right now. Um, so right now it's 25.5% as a percent of expenditures. So it's point where you did 0.5% over what we have currently listed as our cap, which is about, by my calculations, about $215,000. Um, is that $215,000, just in your estimation, would that change our bond rating from what, it, what we received to what we would receive? Um, I would not guess that that $200,000 would impact the bond rating. Okay, so 25% is probably, probably what they meant by having a very healthy, very robust. Well, it, it was over 30%. So they look, at, they look at the they were looking they at look that. at the thirty one percent without the public safety match. Yeah. Okay. No, they were looking at our last fiscal year ending, so which was higher than thirty percent. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and now I have a question for Mr. Johnson about the the millages that are out there that we could lose. Uh, could you remind us when those are coming up and approximately what percentage they passed at last time, to, to your knowledge? Oh, do you have, have those? Yeah, they're in the budget here. Okay. Let me just find the page. Or maybe Commissioner Douglas can find it quicker. I didn't bookmark that. <laughs> I had prepared remarks, and uh, they're on my kitchen counter with my budget. So uh, I'm going to be going off my notes on my phone. Okay, let's see. When are the millages up? Uh, public. And do you know, I mean, so I, I know public safety was about 79% when it last passed. The library, I also know, was very strong. The library is... 2023, 2023 is good for the library. The library was a 20-year mm -hmm. village. Yeah, that was a long time. So, let's see, 16, 17, 18, The public safety, we should be good till 2020. So that's next year? It should be a little bit longer. We just should be longer than that. Wasn't it just last year? Until 21. It was approved, I think, in 16. It renewed in 16. Effective 17, though, so that should be through 22. So, yeah, we would need to vote in 2020. So, fiscal year 21. Okay. And that. All right, so I'm going to go off my notes now. So in case you didn't know, uh, I strongly support keeping the 25% ceiling on our fund balance. Um, I agree, of course, that we need a healthy fund balance. That's very important to us as a city. But we also need to acknowledge what that is, is money sitting in a bank earning a limited return. And if we're in a position to have a balance over 25%, which is the cap that had been set, we should take the time to discuss whether it's better to have that money sitting in a bank waiting for a rainy day or to invest it in our neighborhoods or even to pay down some of that long-term debt where we have those higher interest rates. Um, saving money at the fund balance comes at a cost. Money at, in the bank is not money that we're reinvesting in our neighborhoods. Uh, I'm not an expert on municipal finance, you may be surprised to hear. Um, I am a pretty good Google researcher like many lawyers. Um, and what you find on fund balances is really all over the place. Um, the Mich Michigan Municipal League, for example, if I can find my notes on that, um, most governments should be in, says that most governments should be in the 10 to 20 percent range as fun, of fund balances and percent of expenditures. A very small government might have a 20 to 25 percent target. A very large government might have a 5 to 10 percent target. And the state of Michigan, on its fiscal distress indicator, uses 13 percent for basically everybody. Uh, I am fine. I'm comfortable with raising the floor on this. I think some good arguments have been made to um, to have a to have a floor that's higher than what we have now, higher than that 10 percent, as Mr. Johnson pointed out. Um, when, the, when the city commission wasn't respecting keeping that fund balance in, we got into some, we got into some trouble, and I think we need to be careful about that as well. 
But I think we need to be thinking about what, what are the things that we could be doing with that money right now. And I, I, I honest, I'm very respectful of what Ms. Red, Ms. Red and Mr. Johnson have presented tonight. Uh, and their perspective is that we should be very careful with our money fiscally careful, and that's exactly what their perspective was, should be, and that's what we value. But we, as the city commission, are taking many things into account. One thing is how, we're, how are we managing our bank, bank balance. Another thing is how are we serving our community? Are we giving them what they need? Are we giving them what they want in this community? And we should be balancing those things, and that's the decision that we're making up, we're making up here all the time. We're not just thinking about being safe in case of a rainy day. Um, and I, I, you know, I heard the three months of operations, and that's not... You know, that's not much when you think of it that way, but that, that's, that's a false equivalency to a household budget. So it, it makes sense to me, three months, three months is what you need saved for your household budget. In my household, we have two incomes, and if my husband and I lost our jobs tomorrow, we would be down to zero income, and we would be dipping into that three months expenses, um, through three months to pay off our expenses. The, short of an apocalyptic event, the city of Royal Oak cannot go to zero revenues overnight. Um, and as Commissioner Lavasser was pointing out, you, in the in the worst of the recession, we went down about 10% in our value in our home value, um, which deeply impacted the taxes that we were able to collect. And yet, it didn't happen overnight. It happened over time, and we were able to take that into account. We have been in a very strong period financially for about eight years. We have been growing. We have been strong, and our fund balance has been far above 25% for the from for the last 10 years. So. Um, I heard also that we're projected to be at 18% in five years. For 2017, we had our five-year pro projection was supposed to be 13.75%. In actuality, it was 48.3 or 36.1 if you include public safety. In 2016, we had predicted five years earlier a negative 37.6%. And actually, we were above 25% that year as well. So our predictions, our long-term predictions, have been quite conservative. We've been, we've been outstripping them by quite a bit, and it's time to take that into account. We are sitting on this money that we could be spending for the benefit of our citizens. And if we're not going to be spending it to that, perhaps we should be reinvesting it in this debt that is getting a better rate of return than what we're doing right now, which is just leaving it sitting in the bank. And while I absolutely understand where they're coming from with this letter and what they're presenting to us, our job as a commission is to think more broadly than that about the needs of our community. And I would recommend that we keep the 25% limit and that we abide by it. I'm done. Thank you, motion. Commissioner Lavasser. Uh, I wanted to follow up on something that Commissioner Macy asked with regard to the pensions and OPEB and the change in assumptions that, uh, if, if I understand, they're, they're being mandated or they're being recommended by the state. No, first of all, it's a draft. They're waiting for, they're giving a two-week comment period. And what it is is they're requiring that the trusts calculate these annually with their assumptions and then report to them with those assumptions. Um, what that really is going to require between the um, traditional actuarial valuations that we do, the GASB required, and then if we have assumptions that are different for the state, we're going to be doing six calculations a year. So in addition, the retirement boards are currently having experience studies conducted. So what my point is, if the retirement boards decide to implement the, the state's assumptions or some of the state's assumptions, you know, we're going to see our required contributions increase. So, but it's not required that the, um, that the boards implement the state's requirements for their valuation. It's only to report to the state. They want to see those assumptions for the state reporting purposes. All right, so, so if I'm <coughs> hearing it correctly, uh, uh, let's say for sake of argument, and, and I wouldn't recommend this, but let's say for sake of argument that we decide to go with uh, more optimistic assumptions and put less money toward these retirement accounts, we would have to account to that in the state saying, yeah, you." You told us we should put this much in, but we put half a million dollars less in. These were our assumptions, and we would have to account for that in some fashion, if I'm understanding correctly. Well, yeah, what we would do is um, we have to use their assumptions, and then if we become um, using their assumptions um, under, like, 60% funded, there's some requirements. Okay. That would occur. Now, and I, I don't want to necessarily put you on the spot if you don't know the numbers, but uh, it would be helpful to have some idea of what additional and annual contribution would be required if uh, we went with those assumptions. 
yeah, there's, yeah, there's, it's a big council. They'll increase. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's all I can say. Yeah, I really, I really couldn't put something like that together. So it takes the actuary a couple months to put that together. So, okay. yeah, sorry about that. Ms. Rudd, I just have a question. Um, in my research, I mean, clearly when we talk about um, limits, a, a lot of the communities that I looked at have a minimum, and they've talked a lot about the two to three month minimum that you should have as a best practice. But I also found it rare that at least maybe it's just by happenstance, the ones that I found to have a maximum, you know, percent policy. Did you find the same in your research that it's not, it's more focused on the minimum because it triggers the councils or commissions to act, you know, right away because you've hit that threshold. And now you got to make cuts. You got to cut police officers, you got to cut firefighters, you got to cut city services before you run out of money. But the maximum, I was having a hard time finding a lot of information on that. It seemed to be, well, what are you planning for? What are you saving for? What sort of things do you predict in the future? Mm -hmm. That's perhaps maybe they're found, they're looking at the guidelines with, from the GFOA. They're talking about a minimum, but the GFOA really isn't talking about a maximum um, as well. Like with the, they just mentioned the minimum of no less than two months, but really don't go anywhere with a max. Mr. Mason. So I did find that as well, Mayor Fournier, um, that most, most communities don't seem to have that max, um, which is why we're local, so ahead of the curve in um, making sure that we aren't sitting unduly on, on our uh, citizens' um, money. Um, oh, I had something else to say about it, but now I forgot. Well, I, I think part of me, when I look at this, I can't look at a policy simply in terms of, you know, an isolated policy. No. Because for me, when we do our, our strategic planning in December and January, we take input from all of our residents and we say, okay, these are what the priorities are going to be for the year. We also have some priorities that are very long term. Obviously, we always put public safety first. Um, we have certain investments we have to make. And, you know, staff goes through an arduous process to put together a budget that looks five years in advance, which I believe is pretty progressive compared to a lot of communities. I mean, we won awards for our budgeting process. And for me, when I look at it, I don't, I mean, I see a minimum there as a safeguard, an important thing. And I agree, Commissioner Macy, we need to look at, you know, should it be 10%? Is that enough time to react? Or, you know, because we may not be here and having a good benchmark for a future commission to say 18% is the best number. But from a max, to me, when I look at it, it fluctuates every year based on what our long-term goals are, our medium-term goals are, and our short-term goals. And if we are aligned as a community, what those are, and we have a, you know, we're flush with cash for a period, and then over three years we spend some of that cash to deliver on longer term priorities, does it make sense to have that artificial policy that says, oh, it's 25%, it's 10%, it's 35%, if we already have a plan on how we're going to spend money to deliver on the priorities that our community expects? And so that's my only concern about, I mean, thinking about this radically, like, do you want a max or do you want to really just, you know, focus on what your five-year budget is? Commissioner Perouche. I'm not going to talk about percentages or maximums or minimums. I guess I will just say that having been in this position quite a while ago when the fund balance for the city was extremely low, it was too low and it had been for quite some time. Um, and then economic factors happened. It was an economy that tanked. Um, state share revenue was slashed radically. Property tax values went down significantly. It was like a, a perfect storm of economic indicators that happened to this community and other communities in the state of Michigan all at once in the early 90s. And as a result of that, because our, our fund balance was not as robust as it should have been, and it hadn't been because we hadn't been paying attention to it, um, we ended up with layoffs. We, we ended up with cutting back services significantly. So I get very skittish when, I t when somebody starts talking about, you know, cutting the rainy day fund because it's there for a purpose. We've been very blessed as a community to have had really good prosperity for the last, you know, four or five years when we've been able to build up the rainy day fund to a point where it is pretty healthy. But we can't guarantee that these economic indicators are going to stay as robust as they are. And having lived through a period where when they all tanked all at once, and we couldn't have predicted it, um, it was happening nationally, and it happened to the state of Michigan at the same time. 
uh, it was a, a multitude of factors that happened all together, much to our surprise, um, we were in terrible shape and it, and it led to layoffs. All I'm saying is that you can't always predict, even, even as healthy as we have been the last couple of years, what is going to happen in the future. So when we talk about making sure that we have a healthy enough rainy day fund to get us through a period like that without having to have significant layoffs, I err on the side of having a, a, a perhaps a bigger cushion than perhaps you are talking about. Um, that does not mean that we we budget tens of millions of dollars to sit in a savings account and not spend. But on the other hand, I think we have to be very, very cautious when we talk about significantly cutting the 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 rainy day fund, especially since our budget projects out for five years. And in a couple of years, in 22, 23, it shows us below what the predicted level should be, just based on what we're doing right now. So we've already got within our budgeting process a dip, and that doesn't account for any recession, any crazy economic things that could happen nationally, any major crisis in the country that would have an impact on the economy and therefore cause a lot of things to, to crash as well. Um, so I, on balance, I'm, my view is that, uh, me personally, I'm very, very, very conservative when it comes to this. And I'm very reluctant, especially given the indications from our bond rating agencies that that's a factor in their in their rating. Um, it's not a question of just on a year to year basis how your spending patterns are. It's also based on the amount of the fund balance. And that was a clear indication in the bond ratings that they gave us for our bond issues this year, that they were looking very, very carefully at that fund balance. And because it was as healthy as it was, they were able to give us the good bond ratings that they did. And if it wasn't as healthy as it is, they probably wouldn't have given us those good ratings, which means the taxpayers would have paid more for those those projects that had to be bonded. So um, bottom line is I, I'm very conservative when it comes to stuff like this, and I would be very reluctant to change uh, the policy that we've got in place right now. Commissioner Dubuque. I know we're trying to get to our regular agenda, but um, <laughs> I appreciate uh, Commissioner Perush's comments. I think it's a happy position to be in uh, when the debate of the day is that are we being too conservative and too responsible and too careful with the tax dollars that we're collecting from ourselves and from our neighbors. Um, Commissioner Gibbs and I, with regard to the uh, uh, should we take some of these dollars instead of sitting in a checking account that does not earn anything? Should we transfer some amount of those dollars into shoring up the pension fund and the retirement fund? We've asked staff for some information on what would certain amounts of money, if we were to inject a lump sum of cash into those funds, do? Does that change our necessary return over, you know, right now we're looking at a 30-year return of 7.8, which we're told is is reasonable and, and well within the target range. But if we want to be a little more conservative and we put some some you know, cash injection in there, how does it shrink that? So I'm, I'm definitely happy to have that conversation because then we're, it's a different kind of rainy day fund right. if we put dollars in there because we're um, uh, insuring right. ourselves against a future financial calamity where right now 7.8 over 30 years, well, all the experts say is reasonable, but maybe in 10 years it's, it's not for whatever reasons. So um, I, I think if we're going to have a conversation about where we need to increase uh, expenditures, I would invest in that to the extent that there are dollars available for investing and not in general operations, um, not even in infrastructure, which if there's infrastructure needs, we need to have a conversation about, about revenue and, and where those dollars need to come from. But uh, we do have those legacy costs, which mm -hmm. we've handled responsibly, but if we can shore up those investments a little bit, that's a place we're happy to look, and we're doing that on the Retirement and Pension Board. And, and I would like to, you know, before deciding any future action on this, I'd like to get that information from staff. What does $500,000 today do to those projections? What does three quarters of a million dollars, what does $1.5 million do to those projections over time? Yeah. Especially, just to build on that, with the looming, you know, uh, state recommendation that would, you know, I mean, obviously it's still out there, it's still open, but what does that look like in juxtaposition to what, you know, their very conservative outlooks are? And, you know, I mean, I, to me, if you're going to spend fund balance, you're investing it by putting it into your retirement system and, you know, lowering your ARC payments. There's a, there's a certain financial benefit you get. I can tell you, and I'll tell everyone up here, I'll vote against any use of fund balance to fund operations. I think that is something we're not going to sell land to fund operations. And we're not going to use up fund balance, in my opinion. We shouldn't to, to fund operations. Um, that is a you have to get your 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 um, 
your ins and outs aligned to meet what your, your ins are. So, um, but if there is a, a way that we can protect, and, and I mean, look, we're in this for 100 years, right? So, you know, we're going to be paying pensions for a while because we have people that worked for us and they've done a good job and we made a commitment to them because they made a commitment to us. Um, I'd like to look at that as well. I think that's a fair suggestion. Um, and then see what that means in context of the, of the policy. Commissioner Douglas. Must we have a cap? Mr. Johnson? Well, that, <laughs> that's a great question. I kind of pose that one too. There's no requirement that you have either a cap or a minimum. It's totally optional as far as the commission as to what kind of policy it wishes to have. Okay, I'm going to try something here um, and see if we can, like, narrow this discussion down a little bit. And I'm going to make a motion that we, it may fail, it may succeed, I'm going to make a motion that we forego a cap in our policy, that we retain the 10% minimum, that we forego any dictated cap on our fund balance. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> I, you know, I'm, no, I'm, I'm I just, see uh, thinking. I'm not sure if it's alive or dead. I'm seeing the... I'm just, I'm just trying to narrow it down. I mean, either we're going to have a fund balance, and it's going to be 25% or not. And if it is 25%, then we get to the question of how we spend that excess this year. But, I mean, let's decide if we're going to have a fund balance, and let's decide if, you know, what that level is. Commissioner Dubuck? So what I would be interested in considering is changing the verbiage because, as Mr. Johnson said, like looking at one budget in a vacuum is not helpful. And if what we want is, on average over time, a certain percentage fund balance, then we should be directing staff to target an average uh, over five years of 25%, 28%, 30%, whatever we think that reasonable number is, so they can look at it in context and then tell us in one year, um, even though we went to you know three points above that target, we project X number next year, or we were down below last year, so over time we're in that range. Because I think it, it is more fluid to have a hard deck um, for a municipal budget that has unpredictable revenue sources and circumstances and demands on, its, uh, on our expenditures. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But to have a target that is kind of a north star for staff um, that we look at in the context of multiple budget years, that would make sense to me. I, I agree. I think like as a rolling average or something like that, because you may have a year where you don't have as many expenditures, your fund balance builds up, but then following year you have a plan to, you know, implement a bunch of capital improvements that you're going to have to tap into the general fund for. And so if you would have cut it at 25%, you would not have the money to make those investments the next year. So, you know, just like talking about household budgets, sometimes you, you know, buy a new lawnmower and, you know, the next year you don't spend any money. I mean, things go up and down. But I, I, I do like the idea of looking at things as a, as a North Star over a, a budget period, over five years, to say, hey, the, the weighted average here is 25% or whatever, 30% or something like that. That, to me, makes more sense than looking at it year by year because our expenditures aren't normal year to year. Commissioner Macy. Um, so do I need to do this chart again? Because the projections are horrendously bad, like off by 50% for the past. You know, if they, if they, when they look five years out, they're way, way, way conservative. Well, it is true this commission does overperform. <laughs> Ms. Rudd. Um, just some clarity on what those we call projections. It's not what I think. It's, I know. It, it's, we're just taking the budget year. So what we're saying to commission is if you adopt this budget, like for instance, this spring, the 1819, and we take those assumptions in that year and extrapolate those out, this is what it looks like. Because otherwise I'd have to tell you, okay, well this year I think it's got, I have no idea. No, so that's just the easiest way to communicate it. So I'm not blaming you. Yeah. So, it's not a good rolling average to have because they're way off. Uh, but remember, it's also a sliding scale. Every year we make decisions to make sure we have, you know, a balance to those budget items. So we're making decisions every year to make sure we keep our head above water. So it's also, I mean, when we see those, those long-term projections and they're going down, we're making adjustments year by year, audibles, to, to make sure that we keep a healthy fund balance and that we make decisions with, you know, our collective taxpayer money 
to you know put it in the right areas and keep balance in future years. So it's yes, those predictions are there, but they're never static because we're making decisions here twice a month, you know, to impact those numbers. Commissioner Levaster. Uh, Commissioner Mason, he makes a lot of good points. I mean, n number one, with regard to the uh, uh, future projections. Uh, uh, when, when there's as much variance as we've seen over the years, it's not a good way to uh, measure what that uh, uh, fund balance max should be. Uh, and, and she also makes the good point that uh, this is not like a household budget where you may lose your job, you may lose your 100% of your paycheck. Even during the Great Recession, the uh, taxable value from what, what I see only de decreased by 10%. So that's significant. But it's it's certainly not like losing a 100% of a full paycheck. The the real question here is what do we anticipate, and, and that's why I asked Ms. Rudd the questions I did. If if we have another event such as the the Great Recession that we uh, experienced about nine ten years ago, what type of hit would we take to our budget as a result of that? And that type of information should be guiding us on what that uh, minimum should be and what that max should be. The uh, Max does serve a purpose, and, and we understand how, how government officials like the security, like the to know that there's always going to be funds for three, four years down the road in case of some instances that come up that are less than ideal. But we have to be looking out for the taxpayers as well, and that max is there as a protection for the taxpayers to make sure that we're not gouging taxpayers, many who may be on fixed incomes, to potentially down the road have funds that we might need. Mr. Johnson, just a point of clarification. I mean, taxable values went, or Ms. Rudd, by 10%, but the revenues that the city collected were beyond 10%, correct? Um, I'd, have to, I'd have to look okay. into that. Just want to make sure that you know the problem was bigger than 10%. Um, Commissioner Perush. Well, that also assumes that the only kind of crisis you're going to have is going to have a drop, significant drop in real estate values and your property tax values are going to go down. In the terms of the crisis that I was talking about 20, 25 years ago, it was a combination of factors. It was not only a drop in property tax values, it was a drop in sales tax revenues, it was a drop in income tax revenues, which are your state shared revenues, and it was a drop in, in all kinds of uh, financial and economic activity nationally, which impact your business activity, your sales taxes, and everything else. So as I said before, it was a perfect storm of factors. You can point to the Great Recession, but the significant economic issue there was a drop in property tax values because it was a real estate crisis. And that that's not always the type of crisis that you have um, and that you have to guard against. And I'm not, as I said before, I'm not saying you have to put away tons and tons and tons of money in case there's some bizarre you know, crisis that occurs um, down the road. But on the other hand, I think you have to anticipate that that is in fact a possibility. So in terms of my view and my approach to this whole thing, I tend to be a lot more conservative because in a, in a lot of situations, it's more than just the type of recession that we had a couple of years ago. Commissioner Pruce, you bring up a really good point. It's not always the catastrophic issue that could happen that we always point to. I mean, by one you know, movement of the pen, our CBDG money could be at risk from the federal government. That Royal Oak taxpayers pay into, and we get some of it back here, not all of it, but we do get some of it back, and if that program is ended, you know, a lot of the funds we use that for, for a lot of programs that impact seniors, that impact, um, you know, neighborhoods, I mean, we got to fill those gaps, and having a um, acceptable uh, balance will allow us to do that. I mean, there's a lot of things that aren't huge, but that, you know, one person can, you know, sign a document and, you know, it's a challenge. Commissioner Proof. The, the other thing you have to consider is that, as we talked about before, a lot of our millages are, are, a lot of our revenue is based on millages that have to be renewed. And the ones that we've had on the ballot most recently, within the last four or five years, have been renewed by, a, as Commissioner Macy pointed out, a fairly healthy margin of voters. But that's when the economy was good. If the, attorney, if the economy goes south, are the voters necessarily going to renew a, a library millage or a public safety millage or a, a solid waste millage? I think the odds are significantly diminished that they may not. And there goes a huge, significant portion of our revenue for at least a, a portion of our services. So I think you have, to, you have to keep all of those economic factors in mind when you're considering a, a topic like this that there's a lot of variables out there that we can't predict. 
and that certain economic factors might play into the fact that we may not be able to rely on the millages and the revenues that we have now um, because the voters may say at some point in time, I'm sorry, we cannot afford to, in our household, renew this millage. We can't afford to pay it. So I, I think you have to keep that in mind as well, which again is another reason why I tend to be a lot more conservative on this than a lot of other people. But I've lived through some really ugly times. I've had to lay off police and firefighters and it was not a good, it was not a good thing. It was uh, lots of tears and families and it was, it was very, very hard. I don't want to have to do that again. Commissioner Dubuck. Uh, just to that point, I, I think we are looking out for taxpayers, as we are all taxpayers here, and and uh, you know most of us homeowners, and uh, we're looking out for ourselves, our investments in our home, and for our quality of life by ensuring that when we are in tough times, we're not laying off police officers in mass, we're not closing firehouses, we're not rolling back essential city services. That's how we look out for taxpayers and residents. Because if you start doing that, property values start going down, you start risking people's largest investment, which is their home. So, I mean, what we're talking about is an abundance of caution, which I think is actually valued by residents and by taxpayers. At least I value that as a resident and a taxpayer. I'm gonna hand off here. Commissioner Macy. So all of this discussion that's, a, that's about the things that could happen and the ways we could lose revenue is about the minimum. We need to have a healthy minimum. But that doesn't mean that there should be no maximum. It doesn't mean we should, we should just pile gold coins behind this podium until we, we have you know, infinite, because who knows what might happen. And city government is, is, has to be flexible. It has to be flexible. We have to be able to respond to these changes that happen. And I understand what Commissioner Proust is saying about having gone through this really bad time and not having had this healthy fund balance. But we do have a limit that we do abide by. But what we don't abide by is the cap. And there has got to be, in my mind, some limit to what we are collecting that we are not putting back into our community um, over, over some period of time. And I think it's absolutely true that if we are saving money for something, then we can go beyond that cap. Perhaps we, have, we leave the cap at 25%, and then we say, you know what we want? We want a pool. And we're going to need to save $4 million for that pool. So we're going we're gonna to push up our fund balance over the next five years while we save, mo save money up for that pool. But just saying, well, we don't know. Maybe we're going to want to build something someday, so we should just keep accruing money to, so, to, no, to no ever limit doesn't make sense to me at all. It doesn't make sense in how anyone should run their household, and it doesn't make sense how anyone should run a government. Like, this is what... Oh, okay. Uh, I will move that we... Um, <laughs> let's see, I'm, I'll move that we, ha we, we change it from 10 to 25% to 17 to 25%. We have a motion by Commissioner Macy. Is there a second? Can I... That's the cap? 17 is the minimum. 17 25 is the, minimum. Is the cap. And 25% is, is the maximum, is the cap. Okay. And our numbers now are 10, 10 and 25. And 25. I would like to add to that mission <laughs> instructions that, the, that we that we consider how we would spend the, the additional 200,000 or 215,000 that we are over that cap this year. We have a motion by Commissioner Macy. I'll support or, that. Okay. There's oh, a second by Commissioner Douglas. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, wait, is that? <laughs> so the motion is to move the minimum from 10 to 17 and to keep the 25 at 25 and to take the excess of what Commissioner Macy estimated to be 215000 but whatever that calculation is, and to spend that money this year. Just this year. So you'd have an exact 25% at the end of the year fund balance, and anything above that would be spent. Ms. Rudd has <laughs> well, Ms. Rudd has behind my you, motion. Mayor. <laughs> Those are estimated. Estimated. Those are not actual. No, the numbers that she gave. Right. Yeah. yeah, I'm just saying to put it into context, whatever it's a, but you're pegging to the percentage. Mm -hmm. Adjusting the budget so that the budget follow, abides by this guideline. All right. And we, can and we can decide later how that should be adjusted. Right. I mean, let's right. set, establish this. Maybe to the OPEB, perhaps to parks. Who knows? Could be. Discussion? Mr. Lavasser, I, I think there's some merit to the motion, but I'm, I'm not ready to support it simply because I don't have feedback from Ms. Rudd yet on the questions I asked earlier with regard to uh, truly anticipating what could be a, a worst-case scenario, a rainy day, and what those actual numbers are. 
without those numbers, we really can't say what that bottom number should be. Should it be 10%, should it be 17%. I, I'm not willing to simply accept the, uh, I, I think it was 18% that uh, uh, the one entity was recommending without knowing what those numbers are, what our experiences are. I'll just add that, you know, it, the, the challenge for me is, and I, and I get, I think everyone up here makes good points, and we all have a different value we assess to what is that right amount, and I think trying to find that consensus here at the table is going to be a real challenge because maybe Commissioner Perouche thinks it should be 34.9 percent, no. Commissioner Dubog <laughs> thinks it should be 27 percent, I might say, hey, we shouldn't have a cap. Um, you know, for me, the way I look at it is I'm completely open to um, as we progress through the year, as we've done in many other years, um, seeing where we stand at the budget and then making, and like Ms. Rudd said, having that flexibility, you know, when we have a fund balance, we have the flexibility to say, you know what, this opportunity came up to do X, Y, and Z, and when we predict the rest of the year is going to be good, we can do positive things. If we get hit with an unanticipated expense, then we tap into the fund balance for that and we don't do, you know, um, additional projects, et cetera. So for me, I think um, during the budget planning session and strategic planning session in January, December, and then when we get into budget in May, I'm more comfortable talking about the fund balance in terms of what our goals are and saying, okay, I'm okay putting another $500,000 into this and $200,000 into that, and then seeing what the budget looks like for the next five years. And if we're comfortable with those fund balance predictions, then I think that is, is a better way of going about it than just looking at, you know, putting this hard option in the, in the um, you know, making a, a, a program versus a thoughtful discussion on where we should spend the money. Um, so that's why I struggle to support, you know, a hard cap on it because I, I like to look at it in the context of what we're spending in five years, what our priorities are, but also take a sneak peek halfway through this year, fiscal year, where do, where do we stand? Maybe we have extra money in the budget to do some things and we can be, you know, accomplish those things without necessarily looking at it in terms of a cap. Commissioner Douglas. But bear in mind, this discussion we're having here today is an extension of our budget approval process. I mean, this came out of the June meeting um, where we said we were going to re-examine our 1819 budget in the context of our fund balance. So this is that discussion. Well, I, I mean... Okay, so what we're doing is we're committing to say we're going to spend this money and we don't know where we're going to spend it versus in a budget planning session you say we need to do these things and therefore this is how it impacts our fund balance. I mean, it's a little bit of chicken and egg in my mind. What we're saying, is, Macy. That, sorry, what we're saying is that we're not abiding by our policy. We've, discur we've discovered this discrepancy. How are we going to fix this? And we have lots of ways to spend money. If you want me to come up with 10 ways right now, I can. Um, it's not that there's it's not that there's not opportunities out there to spend the money. I'm hoping to spend sixty thousand today during the agenda. So, Commissioner Macy, you could also lower the millage rate at the budget, you know, and then do it that way. You can always you don't have to spend balance. You can always limit the mill rate. True. You know, so there's lots of different options. Exactly. That's why That's I always feel time. like having a hard rule is always you know limits our options. Commissioner Perouche. I would be willing to support this motion except for the arguments that Ms. Rudd made about the impact that the existing fund balance policy had on our bond ratings and the fact that, the, that any change in that policy now might negatively impact our bond ratings going forward. So that's why I'm not going to support the motion. In general terms, I don't, I, I'm not as uncomfortable uh, with the numbers that you're, project, that you're uh, proposing um, in and of themselves. Um, but with the potential impact of any change, at least this year, um, on our fund balance policy to be a little bit more liberal um, and the potential impact on our bond rating, I just don't want to go down that road. Well, okay. Uh, but this isn't a change. Douglas. I mean, we approved a budget with a 25% cap, and that's what the bond rating agencies have seen and understand. And Commissioner Macy's suggestion to raise the floor should be even more attractive to bond agencies. P point of correction, Commissioner Douglas, we approved a budget that had a higher than 25 percent. The, the policy is oh, different from what we had as far as our outlook. Good point. Sorry. Good point. 
Commissioner Macy. And I specifically asked Ms. Red this question earlier today when I said we're we're at 25.5 percent, which is $215,000 over. Would it have changed the bond rating that $215,000? And Ms. Rudd said she thinks not. No, I thought you asked generally speaking, will it change a bond rating? If we have a 25, yeah, yeah generally speaking. No, specifically, they saw as of June 3rd, that's why I meant, said June 30th of last year, year end, we were in excess of, of 30%. And th that was very favorable that we had such a uh, good fund balance. And that's what, that's what did it. Not the 25, it was in excess of 30%. <clears throat> yeah, I thought you meant if... Yeah, no, I, I, okay. you answered the right question. Sorry Commissioner Dubuc. Uh, and I agree. Commissioner Perush, that's my primary concern uh, for the $250,000 that's at play right now. Um, were we to lose a single grade or a bond rating, that would cost us far more than that you know, quarter million dollars on any future bond offerings. Um, I think... I, I don't mind picking a policy and sticking with it. I, where I'm at is I think the 25... Um, is not where we want to be. I would rather see a policy that takes us to 28, uh, and then also allow staff tell staff that that's a goal to set, and then bring rationales to why we're at where we're at. And you can look backwards if you're concerned about the forward projections, right? We could look backwards five years and try and make sure that we're averaging over five years um, on, a, on a rolling average, or or do three years backwards, only one year forward to to balance out uh, the concerning projections that we usually see. Um, but I'm concerned with that rate, particularly because of the bond issue, but also because I think some of the circumstances that you know, Ms. Rudd has raised that should be consider, considered in setting that rate um, justify a slightly larger fund balance. So I, I'm, I'm open to a motion that sets a, sets a cap and then spends whatever we got over that cap. I just think the cap that the current policy is too low, so I can't support this motion. Commissioner Macy. Um, so, sorry, Ms. Rudd, um, or maybe this is for the commission. Are we looking to bond anything else out? Please say no. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't believe we have anything uh, in the CIP. So I'm. Um, so we have we have nothing else planned that we're going to be need this bond rating for. I mean we're, we're we're pretty well maxed out. Well, I will say a couple years ago we were not looking at a city hall, a central park, and a police station. So I mean these things could come on very quickly. Um, you know, the DPS building, uh, is that next? <laughs> no, but I mean, I think it, it's a fair point because you do, I mean, it takes years to build up a fund balance, right? I mean, Mr. Johnson's accounting of history, I mean, it went from zero to where it's at today over a long period of time. And let's just say that, you know, um, they, the residents decide that they want to renew the road millage again for something else, like we don't know, or part of it, or whatever. We bonded to save a lot of money and pull a lot of those projects ahead of time to save taxpayers money, to save all of us money. And, you know, if we don't have a fund balance to, to, to react to that, I mean, the, the, it's, it goes away in a year, but it takes a very long time to build up. So maybe we don't have anything on the dock at the next couple years. Maybe we want to refinance it. Maybe interest rates dip again. You know, um, I just think that you can't automatically build a fund balance of 30% in one year. You just can't do it. It takes years to get to this point. Got a motion on the floor. Huh? Got a motion. Any other discussion? Recap it. Okay, so the motion on the table is to go from 10 to 17 minimum and to keep the 25 and to... Um, take the excess over the 25 and allocate that for expenditures for this year. TBD expenditures, as recommended by staff for us to approve. Really awesome expenditures. Thanks for yeah. Yeah. City managers recommending a city manager's mansion. <laughs> you know, I don't know if that will make the cut. No, we got to read about um, that. <laughs> all right, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. Nay. Oh, that's sad. Okay, motion fails. All right, I think we went, we went way 45 over. minutes above, but I think this was a very healthy discussion, and hopefully uh, everyone here appreciated it, so we thank you for your patience. Um, we have to make a motion to adjourn this meeting. It's a special wait. meeting. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Douglas, second by Commissioner Macy. Um, discussion? All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Special meetings adjourned, and now we begin city commission meeting. So, 
Um, we're going to call to order the August 27, 2018 Royal Oak City Commission meeting to order. We're going to begin with an invocation given by Commissioner Gibbs, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand if you can. This evening and always, we ask for grace, guidance, and discernment as we gather and discuss important issues for our community tonight. May our discussions be thoughtful and polite. May our decisions be reasoned and proper. May all who speak do so with kindness, and may empathy always be used. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, this brings us to item number four, which is uh, the proclamation designating September as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Um, I know we're 45 minutes past due. Do we have someone here to, okay. Um, So I'm going to read this proclamation on behalf of the Royal Oak City Commission. It's a proclamation designating September 2018 Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Whereas childhood cancer is the number one cause of death from disease among children, and whereas around the world, 43 children per day, that is one child every two minutes, is diagnosed with cancer. And whereas one in every 1,000 persons 18 years old in the United States is a survivor of childhood cancer, as a result of overall cure rates that have risen to 80% over the past 40 years. And whereas only 4% of federal government cancer research funding goes to childhood cancer research. And whereas lifelong follow-up care is recommended for all childhood cancer survivors due to the possibility of late side effects associated with treatment. And whereas the impact of childhood cancer diagnosis produces multiple challenges to a family, and whereas children and their families need and deserve the full support of their communities while undergoing treatment. And whereas our community has the opportunity to make a significant impact on the lives of children currently being treated for cancer, childhood cancer survivors, and their families. Now therefore, be it resolved, I, Mayor Fournier, and the members of the Royal Oak City Commission hereby <coughs> proclaim September 2018 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month and will commemorate the month with yellow ribbons tied on trees and signposts to raise awareness of childhood cancer and its symptoms. Thank you, sir. Um, and, yeah, I'd like to just say I lost, we lost our daughter last year in June to, to cancer. Um, she was treated at Royal Oak Beaumont. And I just, you know, just seeing these little ribbons down the street of Main Street, we'd like to just have them all peppered down there just so people just have take a little bit of time and think about it that you know our kids do deserve a lot more than what we're getting and Royal Oak such a good great community I just think you guys are you know it's going to come together and one day it might make a difference so thank you brings us to item number five of the agenda, public comment. Just a few rules before we begin. Um, the City Commission does rely on the input of our fellow citizens to make decisions. Now is the time set aside for the public to address the City Commission on any city-related issues, whether it's on the agenda or, to, or not on the agenda tonight. Uh, we ask that you speak to the Commission as a whole and not to individual commissioners. Uh, if you wish to speak tonight, uh, public comment, please wait until recognized by me, the Mayor, Come up to the podium. For the record, we will ask you to state your name and address. Uh, please be mindful that we do want to hear from every, everyone who wishes to speak tonight. Uh, so your comments are limited to three minutes or less. And uh, there's a timer at the podium to help you keep track of your time. Uh, if you don't wish to speak tonight, that's all right. Please reach out to us via email or whatever way you feel comfortable with and uh, share your comments with us. Um, please note that the City Commission won't respond directly to questions during public comment. However, we are taking notes 
and we'll address those questions when the uh, agenda item is discussed or if it's not on the agenda, um, City Manager Don Johnson is taking notes and we'll also refer those issues to uh, the proper city department uh, to get those matters resolved. Um, and like I said, our city manager is taking notes and he's pretty good at following up on uh, questions that people bring here uh, at public comment. So with that, who's first to speak tonight? Yes, ma'am. Here in the front. Ms. Gay Montgomery, I'm 30, at 3439 Benjamin Avenue, Condo 226, Royal Oak 48073. I'm president of the Fairways Board of Directors, and um, we would like to make a few remarks about the assertions in the administration's comments. 45 years ago, the developers and the city could not have anticipated the extent of how pervasive this issue would become. Eventually, the north face of 3439 Benjamin has become a backstop for golf balls. The green hole is 129 to 140 feet from the front door. New technology has increased the power and velocity of golf balls, causing more damage and or greater injury. Every shutter except one on the north side of 3439 Benjamin has dents from golf balls. People have reported golf balls going into our pool while they are there swimming. Approximately 50 to 100 dents are in the portico above the entrance door of 3439 Benjamin Avenue. Each year we have several windows broken. One year we had 11 broken. Previously, fairways replaced these windows with no claim against the city. Newer windows are more expensive. The association can't continue to absorb this expense. Numerous car windows have been broken by golf balls. One entire parking lot has been rendered useless due to the risk of property and person, therefore decreasing our parking space by 30%. Our main concern is there is a moral responsibility to protect visitors from injury or death. Visiting family, friends, delivery people, contractors living outside the city can't possibly be aware of the danger of fast moving golf balls. The city owned golf course of the city owned golf course reimbursement of injury and or damage would be much greater compared to the cost of the golf course net. Other nets protecting the cars by the driving range, homes along 13 Mile Road, and other areas have been installed by the city. Why not protect visitors to fairways? Cost of the net is a small price to pay to avoid someone receiving a closed head injury, regardless of how the liability is apportioned, even if the responsible golfer could be identified. A financial damage award would be wholly inadequate, a wholly inadequate response to a serious injury or loss of life. We are presenting an equitable agreement, equity agreement from a taxpaying group of citizens concerned about public safety and a responsible solution to this problem. And we do have uh, copies of this for each commissioner. Okay. Ms. Montgomery, if you want to bring the copies to our um, Ms. Hallis, our city clerk, we can uh, pass them down if that's okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your attention to this, for your listening. Okay, who's next this evening? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Honorable Mayor, members of the city council, and staff and uh, residents. Uh, Normandy Avenue Sir, is... Sir, do you mind if we can have your name and address for the record, sorry. please? I'm sorry. Michael Golden, 4147 Normandy, Royal Oak. Uh, Normandy Avenue is uh, in the very far northwest corner of Royal Oak, right along 14 Mile Road there. And it's very close to Birmingham. And in Birmingham, the uh, residents, we, the, uh, the city restricts any crosstown traffic in Birmingham. 
uh, Lincoln and Maple are originally four lane roads, and now they're both down to two. There is a left turn lane on the uh, on Maple. The um, overflow down to 14 Mile Road is uh, is quite large, and it overflows onto Normandy, 13 and a half Mile Road, and the speed is ignored, making it dangerous for kids, seniors, and the hard of hearing. Future traffic, traffic calming berms will reduce that risk. Steel hauling uh, semis use Normandy as a cut through from Greenfield to Coolidge. Greenfield and they go across uh, Normandy and to the Flexen Gate Corporation, which is a stamping plant. They make frames for uh, automobiles. So it's really heavy steel, and that's what is on some of these trucks that are traveling over there. The uh, traffic committee study shows that uh, 27 trucks travel Normandy during the average workday, seven to seven. That works out to about two monster trucks per hour going down Normandy. Normandy is to be rebuilt within a couple years, and the no truck sign at Greenfield and at Woodward will keep Normandy flatter than otherwise. Royal Oak engineers have noted that it is freezing water in cracks that uh, destroy the road with the potholes. It's actually the very heavy trucks that caused the fine cracks originally. Then the uh, winter freeze thaw comes along, as we all know, and uh, creates the breakup potholes. The patching creates mounds that are the main reason for repaving. Cities could use a smaller steamroller when uh, to follow the uh, hot patch crew to create a smoother surface. M Mr. Golden, I do need you to finish your final thought, sir. Okay. I'm sorry. To um, make repaving the road less often. I appeal to the uh, council to approve the recommendation of the traffic committee on the issue that's on the agenda tonight. Thank hey, you. Thank you, Mr. Golden. Apologize for wearing my sunglasses, but like Commissioner Macy, my glasses are on my kitchen counter. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Karen Perslow. I live at 2515 Benjamin Avenue, and I'm here to speak on my own behalf on a couple of issues. First, I wonder if the police chief has the privilege of free parking throughout the city. I scrolled through the Michigan Court's website list of traffic citations and parking tickets for the 44th District Court covering Royal Oak and Berkeley and found at least 10 parking tickets over several years issued to Corrigan O'Donohue, all of which were dismissed. I also went through my own history, which contained a number of parking tickets, all of which were paid, and most of which were because one of my children was driving a car registered to me for a period of time. It just seems suspect to me that Chief O'Donohue's tickets were all dismissed. And I wonder if this is a perk of the job or if it's in his job description. And I know you won't answer that question. Second, I'm not sure who all has them, but I believe uh, some of the commission members have parking passes identified for official city business. I assume they're intended for, intended for official city business only and not for parking at school concerts or other non-official social events. I would encourage use of these passes as intended. Last, I would like to comment about the artist who was arrested for parking a colorful image on a viaduct which is otherwise drab and crumbling. I remember driving home from work that day, seeing it and thinking what a fun idea it was. This image was immediately painted over with gray paint while the viaduct on my street, which contained graffiti for a long period of time, was not painted over until very recently. 
Rather than arrest the artist for attempting to make Royal Oak a more pleasant place, I believe he should be invited to paint in other areas, including viaducts. I'm sure I'll hear all about rules, laws, and ordinances, but come on, arresting an artist and charging the guy is a little out of line for painting a bunny. In conclusion, for many years, I've wanted to come to the commi commission with various concerns, but have not done so for personal reasons. No more. Thank you for your time. And if anybody wants to know uh, Corrigan O'Donohue's um, parking tickets, I have the list. I made it this afternoon. Who's next this evening? Uh, yes, sir, here in the front. My name's Thomas Cocklemeyer. I'm at 4204 South Verona Circle. Um, that's at the corner of Normandy and uh, Verona Circle. To add to this gentleman's um, uh, issue is, is I've lived there 20 years, and I took this picture this morning. And I, because the traffic comes off of Greenfield, they step on it. They don't realize because they're not... They don't go through the neighborhood that much. They don't realize there's a stop sign there. Earlier this year, I had your, uh, the DPS replace the stop sign. That seemed to work a little bit, but that didn't help much. Then I put this little green man here to help bring awareness that there is a stop sign there. But due to the heavy truck traffic and other people using Normandy as a, a cross route, it's causing, you can see, damage here. I also have a picture looking at Normandy at Woodward. So you can see the effects of this. And I believe this was repaved back in 2003 or 2002. But as the gentleman stated, just the patching here just doesn't work. As it, these big trucks come along, they just kick it up because they're, they're, they're coming to a, a screeching halt at the stop sign, which then kicks up the, the patching. And then as, you know, as the water gets in there and freezes, it, it, it just creates a mess. I live there, and now the noise, the holes, when the trucks go across the holes, it makes all this noise. It's, it used to be a nice, a nice thoroughfare because there was not that much traffic. Now there's a lot of traffic, especially with the construction this summer. So please consider putting a no, no truck sign there, but also please consider looking at fixing some of these areas. Just a small, just dig it up, take a, a roller, and make sure it's patched correctly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tuckmeyer. See a hand way in the back? Good evening. Lynn Getz from Danaskis Consulting and Development. Um, I'm a government relations and business development specialist at Danaskis Consulting, which is located at 169. West Clarkston in Lake Orion. Today, I brought to you um, some information from one of our clients, Weed Maps. To be clear, Weed Maps does not ever touch marijuana. They are a legislative policy and education resource. They have asked that I bring you some information so that you can examine some of the issues that are surrounding medical marijuana right now. Um, much like this gentleman here, uh, my husband and I had a family member that was uh, suffering from cancer stage four. And when you look at medical uh, options, at that point, at the end of life, you look at whether or not you're going to use morphines, you're going to use these opiates, which means a lot of times your, your patient, your loved one at the end of life is facing a situation where they may be more sleeping than not. And someone suggested marijuana as a possible alternate. At that time, my loved one could not use uh, medical marijuana because we couldn't guarantee its safety. Frankly, it was under the old caregiver patient model, which is still in effect, but they now have provided facilities and uh, safety testing and things like that in our legislature. What I have for you today is some of the weed maps information that they presented at the Michigan Municipal League. Um, it's on a disc so you can take it home, look at whenever you guys have a chance. Um, if at some point, I also have my business card in there, if at some point this is something that you'd like to develop further or look at further, especially in light of the fact that recreational marijuana is on the November ballot, what would all these avenues mean to you as a city, 
I would be glad to come back and for about 15, 20 minutes, or perhaps Justin Donaskis, the partner at the firm, come back and tell you this is what it would mean if you opted in, you don't opt in, how recreational is going to impact your community if you do and do not, and what will happen from that. So I've got these for you. I'll just give them to your clerk, and then whenever you guys want to take a look at them, and like I said, my business card is in here for you. I would be glad to be a resource for you as well as our client. Thank you, Ms. Getz. Who's next? Yes, ma'am. Uh, city Commission, uh, City Clerk, thank you. Um, I'm here on behalf of the truck traffic sign that's proposed to be put uh, along Normandy. I'm a, a neighbor of Tom and also of Mr. Golden, and I'd like to reiterate that I believe hey, that this sign. Can you have your name and address for the record? I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Suzanne Nolte, 4217 South Verona Circle. Uh, again, I'm a neighbor of Tom and of Mr. Golden. Uh, the, as you can see from Tom's photos, the uh, roadway has become atrocious, and I realize that it's going to be on the docket for repaving at some point. So I believe that this sign, along with other um, measures that I believe are coming to be implemented to reduce truck traffic, are something that should be implemented here, which is why I'm speaking today. This is a route that uh, normally the Wolverine Cycling Club would take to get to Beverly School, which is located in Beverly Hills um, off of Southfield Road. They no longer can take that route for safety reasons, um, but they do travel within the city, so that is one cycling club that does not take that route. Again, I think Tom's pictures can speak to that. Um, it is also very noisy, and it is uh, a rather dangerously paved road. So that's something that I wanted to, the, the council to address. Again, I know that um, this is just the addition of putting up a sign, but given the meeting that you just had talking about being fiscally responsible by putting up these signs, when the road is eventually repaved, we could avoid having further truck traffic damage any new road that we would be putting in. So that is why I recommend to this council, if we could in fact put that sign in, it would be appreciated by the residents. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Nolte. Mm -hmm. Okay, who's next? I think I saw this hand come up first right here. Yes, ma'am. There's no criteria. It's random. Um, I'm Gail McGuire, and I live at 4456 Arlington. And a lot of people use Normandy Road as a cut through from Woodward to Greenfield and vice versa. But the most annoying thing are the large trucks that cut through. And this is, this is an all residential area. And I know from um, firsthand experience living off Greenfield, um, how noisy those trucks can be when they hit the potholes um, before you resurface it. And thank you for resurfacing Greenfield. But before you resurface Greenfield, the trucks hitting the potholes were keeping me up all night long. And so I'm sure the people that live on Normandy are being subjected to the same noise. Um, so please, no trucks on Normandy. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGuire. Yes, sir, in the back. <coughs> Hello, Travis Moore, 613 Detroit Avenue. And today I'm here representing the entire Royal Oak Animal Shelter Committee. <coughs> Um, as you know, Arts, Beats, and Eats is coming up this weekend, and this year Billings Lawn Equipment has generously donated their parking lot to use for official Arts, Beats, and Eats parking <coughs> with the proceeds going to the Royal Oak Animal Shelter. Um, as you all know, the operations of the shelter rely on volunteers and donations. This is a huge financial opportunity for the shelter However, at this time, we are low on the number of volunteers needed to make this happen. As it sits right now, we may only have enough people to offer the parking on two of the four days of the event. This would be disappointing because the shelter could really use these funds. We have several different shifts available, and I encourage everyone to spread the word about our need for volunteers or consider volunteering as well if you're available. Information can be found on the Animal Shelter's Facebook page, and volunteers can sign up by calling the Animal Shelter at 248-246-3364 or stop in to sign up for an available shift. I would like to see us get enough volunteers to staff every shift as this is money that most certainly can be used by the shelter. And also, um, 
I'm providing a save the date for October. We have uh, Vets for Pets coming up on October 11th from 6 to 9, and that will be at Farina's in Berkeley. And I encourage everybody to check the city website for details as that time approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore, and thank you for your service on the uh, Animal Shelter Committee. And, you know, if anyone has time, it's a few hours of your afternoon, hopefully on a nice day, uh, do some good things for uh, the Royal Oak Animal Shelter. So good call to action, sir. Mr. Mayor, just to clarify, that was at the, the Animal Shelter's Facebook page that people can get more information? Yes, yes. Uh, and you can call the Animal Shelter direct, right, Mr. Moore? Yes, that's And they, you can there sign up. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet at the front counter of the Animal Shelter that will remain there until Wednesday. But even if people want to volunteer Thursday, we'll take all the help we can get. Okay, perfect. So we can sign up sheet at the shelter. You can call there, check Facebook, message. We got great volunteers on the board and folks working there that will bird dog and make sure that if you want to volunteer, it'll find a spot for you. And they're great people too. So, you know, be a fun, fun time to spend time. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Kathleen Salfaro, and I would like to re reiterate the comments of those who would like to prohibit heavy trucks on Normandy. Um, my name is Kathleen Silfaro. I live at 4103 Parkway, which crosses Normandy, and I am at that cross spot. And, um, and I just want to say that the heavy trucks certainly make noise. I want to reiterate everything that my conferers have said. Um, and we know that the heavy trucks, the 18 wheelers, 20 wheelers, whatever, they certainly crack the pavement. And then when we have our, our freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw, that really amplifies the damage. At this point, the repairs are so impossible that many of us just avoid Normandy near Woodward and near Greenfield if possible. It is so, it's in such awful condition. And um, to add to that, I understanding the funding source for Normandy is different from the regular city source having contacted the city, they said that that's state money that's needed, and so apparently that's, and that would make a difference possibly. So we really need to be really even more careful of that street. So the more we can preserve the work that's going to be done and really ban heavy trucks, I think that will really aid in the long run and help us be more fiscally responsible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Forum. Yes, sir, here in the front in the blue shirt, please. My name is Jim Tooman, 139 Amelia Avenue, Royal Oak, 48073. A couple months ago, I came to address the commission here on teen suicide, which is now the number one killer of kids. I have just returned from ad addressing the Kentucky legislature a week and a half ago because they are running at an epidemic proportion there. This is not going to go away. I came here tonight, this is my community, and I want to try to protect the kids as best I can. I'm a global youth speaker. I've spoken in every state in 11 foreign countries. And this has been a mission of mine for a long time. As someone, while I was in school, there was a product of three suicide attempts as a high achiever kid. So I know this issue. And I listen to these kids, and my phone rings off the hook. Somewhere along the line, if schools could have done it alone, they would have done it way before now. So it takes a coalition to come together in this community to look at these issues. Because the one, the first question out of the gate during my Q&A, and I spoke for about an hour and a half there, the first question was, why do we allow this to happen? Why do we fall asleep at the switch? Suicide wasn't even in the top 20 when I first started speaking 39 years ago. Now it's climbed to number one. And the big question is, how many more kids do we have to lose before we could come together and really address these problems? And they are solvable. The difficult challenge that we have is that kids don't feel safe in school. They don't feel safe to be themselves, and we're not talking just physical safety. We're talking about emotional safety. 
The most loneliest time of a kid's day is lunch. Guess why? You have the power groups, you have the wannabes, but you have the loner kids that sit by themselves. And everybody in school perceives that they're losers and they're alone and they have no friends. So after a while, after doing this day after day, week after week, their isolation takes over. And that is a challenge that we can remedy. I've developed 11 programs with an average success shelf life of 15 plus years in schools all over the country. We could do it in this community. The big question is we have to stand up and make it work. As I exit tonight with my time, during, after I spoke, there was a huge lineup of legislators that came up to talk to me. Three of those legislators, when they gave me a hug, whispered in my ear, my son just took his life. My daughter just took her life. Usually, because we're a reaction-based culture, we never address these things until they hit close to home. Well, suicide is not a victimless act. It's not an isolated act. It affects communities, it affects families, it affects schools. And so all of us in some way are going to be touched by this as we progress. I'm willing to do anything I can for this commission and for this community to come together. I have a worldwide reputation. PBS just did a documentary on my life. I was in a national movie playing myself as a speaker that's had 14 million views. I just did a TED talk all in the last year and a half. I'm willing to do whatever I can, but I'm 77 years old and my hourglass is running down. I'll leave you that I got a call from a young girl the other day that said, if somebody smiles at me today, Jim, I won't take my life. Thank you for giving me the time. Thank you, Mr. Tuman. I think I saw a hand here, Dr. Anderson. Wally Anderson, 404 Mount Vernon Boulevard. Uh, when I read through the snow removal ordinance draft you'll be considering tonight, I thought, wow. Back when I was objecting to adding sidewalks, uh, a city official who shall remain nameless pointed out that there was no ordinance requiring sidewalk clearing. Uh, my response was, of course, oh, come on, now we wouldn't do that. Uh, and I'm going to preface Soren's and my questions with reference to the email you got Saturday from Paul and Erica Sykes. It is thorough, specific, and accurate. I was particularly struck by their points that the city itself sometimes cannot comply with the 24-hour requirement and that there's no provision for warning or appeal. Some questions the draft raised for Soren and me. Why is so much of the language imprecise and general? For example, what is a pedestrian facility? If it's a sidewalk, say sidewalk. Why is the term reasonable used as a criterion? To whom and in what places? Reasonability is not a commonly defined cr criterion. Uh, four inches of snow is a clear standard, but why is any amount of ice also specified? That seems clearly unreasonable. How can we, all ice be removed, particularly with refreezing? Why are the zones defined so vaguely and by examples rather than by definitions? For example, we think we are in a residential area, yet the closest school to us is Royal Oak High School. That's over a half mile away, and we don't have any student foot traffic. Um, what does zone four mean? What's a remaining area? In contrast to the above imprecise language issues, there are specific standards that are rigid and punitive. Why are the special spe speci specified times so rigid? How can allowing 24 hours for residential areas be considered reasonable? Why does immediate winter maintenance section six allow broad powers for the city to act without first contacting an owner and providing the due process and appeals? 
Why require a 36-inch wide pathway free of winter hazards? Any one of us who's lived through any Michigan winter knows that's not realistic. I'm confident it's good to provide the public with reasonably unimpeded passage. However, the requirements then need to be reasonable and realistic for property owners, especially seniors. Should not the spirit of any snow removal ordinance be to warn and, if necessary, punish the relatively few offenders rather than setting draconian standards for those of us, especially seniors, who try to do our best? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Yes, sir, in the back corner. Council. Uh, Scott Marion. I'm a uh, realtor here in the city of Royal Oak uh, with Real Estate 126236 Woodward Avenue. Um, I'm also a board member of a program called Rock and Resources. Uh, what we do is we bring events to your city as well as others um, for the heroin and opiate awareness program. We bring vendors that teach, uh, such as suicidal uh, candidates, how to get help without, it's called Hope Not Handcuffs. Some of you may be aware of that. Um, we have brought 27 vendors to Warren alone um, in, an, in an attempt to take drugs back, uh, some of your medications that are sitting in your, in your uh, medicine cabinets that may or may not be considered opiates. Uh, we have uh, drug tarot bags that you can bring those back to back and they can be disposed of properly. Do not flush them down the toilet. <laughs> um, other things uh, we're bringing together, and I've got a few samples here of what we did in Warren. We are going to bring June 1st of 2019. Uh, we, we have a 5K run run by FAN, which is Families Against Narcotics. Uh, that's going to be in Clawson Park. Um, but we're bringing in all of Oakland County, uh, including uh, Philip Bertolini, um, who is the CIO of Oakland County, uh, is behind this program 100%. I want to make people aware that we need to get out to the public and bring the public to the to these events as well. Um, I'm going to leave these with you. I appreciate you guys being here. I know you'll spread the word. Uh, and this is a serious event. Um, we need to make sure. I, I'm a direct uh, uh, victim of the opiate uh, problem, epidemic, I should say. And uh, I just recently uh, had to adopt my four grandchildren. So understand that I'm very serious about this epidemic and we're gonna bring it to every city if we can and make sure that the people out there aren't committing suicide by heroin and opiate uh, uh, drugs and, and that is what they're doing. Uh, and try to get them off the street and get them the help that they need. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Marion. Yeah, okay. please do give those to uh, Ms. Hallis. We'll make sure we get them. Thank you. Thank you. In the far back. I made it before I get a parking ticket. Uh, Janice Wagman, 600 Wellesley. I'm here to talk about the snow removal ordinance, uh, first of all. This is basically the same ordinance that was presented and rejected by the City Commission less than one year ago. Paraphrasing just a few of your comments that were made then, Commissioner DeBuck said that 24 hours after a snowfall presents some serious enforcement troubles and that a $100 fine seems too high. Commissioners Douglas, Donegan at the time, and Mayor Fournier were in favor of customizing for commercial areas and main corridors, mile roads, etc., and eliminating residential neighborhoods from the ordinance. Mayor Fournier left the ordinance or felt the ordinance may not improve snow removal. 
that charging the average Joe $100 is going to create more problems than it's going to solve. And he cited roses for low income and seniors. Roses has got some serious problems with as far as uh, enough people. The commission asked the city to look into a city contractor to research whether we do have a problem, and if so, how big it is, the success rate of other cities who have impl implemented similar ordinances, and to improve education of the public. Mr. Gillum stated, the time frame of 24 hours when snow stops falling is as clear as mud. The ordinance could be restricted to define corridors, eliminating residential areas, and that finally, he confirmed that the city has no liability in this matter. Since ice is included, will we be fined when it is so cold salt doesn't work or when it continually refreezes? What about the piles of snow created by the city at the ends of sidewalks, sometimes days after the homeowner has cleared the sidewalk? Given that none of the information you have requested has been presented, and this ordinance, except for citing various zones, is basically the same, and none of you were in favor of it less than a year ago, why is it back on the agenda? This is definitely government overreach and may penalize many people who have good intentions, especially seniors who should not be shoveling, for the failure of a few. And since I still have time, uh, with regards to ROGO, if this five-year millage passes, it will more than double what you currently pay in taxes for transit. But parents, it will also cost you $360 per year per student to ride the public bus. I encourage you to ask the school board to revisit school buses like so many other districts who provide for all grades, not just junior high, mid, I dated myself, middle and high school. If this passes, your chances will be zero for having real safe school buses with trained school bus drivers who can monitor misbehavior such as bullying and report to the school district. Historically, Royal Oak taxpayers have been extremely supportive of millages for the schools if we want to encourage young families to move into Royal Oak, we need to offer school buses. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wegman. Uh, I see a hand, a plaid shirt there on the left, or your left, my right, or your right, my left. Good evening. Brian Ellison, 26029 Delton Street. Um, I, had, I had a thing written out here, but that's really not my thing. So. Um, I saw most of you guys the other night, uh, last week, Thursday, at the groundbreaking for the uh, new police station. Um, I know that uh, I didn't have a chance to talk to any of you, um, but I know that at least some of you uh, certainly talked to some other people about me. Um, I would like to reiterate, as I, have, as I have in the several emails that I've sent you guys, that if you do have any questions about what I'm seeking or what I'm talking about or, or, or what I, the message I'd like to convey, that... You, you can contact me. You guys all have my contact information. So if you have a question, you can feel free to ask me. Um, I also heard Mayor Fournier talking about how uh, the Royal Oak Police Department is the greatest around. And um, I think it's that kind of blind uh, ignorance to the fact and uh, repeating a rhetoric because it makes you feel good. I think that's, the, that's why you guys are going to have a hard time uh, fixing any of these problems. Um, the problem with the leadership in the, in the department is a serious problem. I was arrested on Thursday for disorderly conduct for holding a sign. Um, the, the description on the, the citation that I was given reads, defendant organized a protest at a public event. Defendant was given an area to protest and was warned multiple times to stay in that area, uh, to stay in that area while protesting. Defendant held a sign in the event as protest. Now, I'm sure I wouldn't expect you guys to be legal scholars and understand the um, concept of, of disorderly conduct, um, but certainly holding a sign and, and keeping your mouth shut doesn't constitute disorderly conduct. However, what I've come to expect from the city is that there will be a, another malicious prosecution. I expect that, that those charges will be pressed despite the fact that the junior prosecutor won't want to charge them. Um, and I can expect more frivolous motions, uh, like I received on Friday, when the city attempted to, when the city served my attorney with an emergency motion, uh, which is usually reserved for something that I would consider probably life or death, um, to, to uh, enact what is effectively a restraining order on behalf of all police officers anywhere against myself and anybody acting on my behalf. So I'd just like to read this because I think it's, it's amazing. This is what the city attorney wrote. Wherefore, 
The people of the City of Royal Oak respectfully request that defendant's bond be modified pursuant to MCR 6.106D to prohibit defendant and or any other person acting on his behalf from coming within 50 feet of any uniformed police officer unless defendant has reasonable cause to believe that he has been the victim of a crime. I have been the victim of a crime and I will continue to let the police officers that I interact with know that I have been the victim of crime. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ellison. All right, who's next? Mr. Wolf, I see your hand here. I can't see you, I can just see your hand. Well, you'll see me shortly. Voila, there you are. Yes, Ron Wolf, 333 North Troy Street. First, I want to point out, a long time ago, I exposed uh, members of the Pontiac City Council uh, for using city gas in their private vehicles as much as uh, $1,200 a month. And this was right uh, during when the uh, police department and the fire department were being dissolved and people were desperately asking to take, uh, volunteering to take cuts in pay. Okay. First, I want to give a shout out to Lauren, who sent me this fascinating article that explains how citizens are manipulated. It's called the Delphi Technique. More and more, we are seeing citizens invited to participate in various meetings, councils, boards, or committees to help determine public policy in one field or another. Residents are, are included purportedly to obtain input from the public to help officials make final decisions on taxes, community growth, or whatever the particular subject matter might be. Sounds great. Unfortunately, service appearances are, not, are often deceiving. If a citizen decides to take part in one of these meetings, generally you will find that there is already someone designated to facilitate. Supposedly, the job of the facilitator is to be neutral, non-directing the helper, to see the meeting flow smoothly. Actually, he or she is there for exactly the opposite reason. They are there to see that the conclusions reached are in accord with a plan already decided upon by those who called the meeting. This process used to facilitate is called the Delphi Technique and was developed by the RAND Corporation for the U.S. Department of Defense back in the 50s and was originally intended for use as a psychological weapon during the Cold War. However, it was soon recognized that the steps of the Delphi Technique could be very valuable in manipulating any meeting toward a predetermined end, predetermined by you, the government, our government. I find this to be reprehensible. I find that no action ha has been taken to look into grants for a downtown park or even uh, looking into uh, any corporations like Ford Motor that's supporting Arts, Beats and Eats for support for adding to a downtown park simply because the park was promised to Arts, Beats and Eats as a replacement for a uh, few days that they needed uh, uh, because their uh, previous staging areas are being taken. Mr. Wolf, I need you to finish your final thoughts, sir. All right, my final thoughts is I'm asking you to support the seniors tonight at the um, Royal Oak Manor. If you are contributing to early death of many of these seniors by exposing them to unnecessary stress, Suicide rates are high among seniors as well. And uh, often the suicide is neglecting to take their medications. And also I want to point out that I ask for support of the valet service that will be a tax paying business and will provide free service for seniors. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. It's a lot of final thoughts. <laughs> Robin Richardson, I'm actually a resident of Farmington Hills, but I'm here on behalf of the Farmer's Market. Um, I'm asking to be added to the agenda because we'd like to put a banner up um, that's going to advertise our Oktoberfest that's coming up September 14th and 15th. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Uh, yes, sir.
Mr. Ashley. I'll be brief. I had to choose between red and blue. I just picked red. And you're the same color as the chair today, so, you know. I'm sorry. Floating head. Confused me for a minute. <laughs> I was watching the carpet when I was coming up, so. <laughs> um, I live at Royal Oak Manor. Uh, I know we're on the agenda, and I want to uh, make known that uh, people only with hang tags that are bought from the city will be parking on 7th Street. That is the only people that will be parking there will also be parking on Williams and on 6. So those are the only people. There will be no other people. Uh, there are a few spaces open that we uh, hope that we will be able to let uh, caregivers park there. Um, that is uh, very important because we have several members who have caregivers 24 hours a day. I believe they have uh, hang tank passes. Uh, I distributed a bunch of them <laughs> the other day. But, um, yes, only hang tank pass people will be there. We had a rough weekend. We lost three people in our building. So uh, one of them was a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. But anyways, um, that is what I wanted to say. And part of that, um, the 28 spaces will help us greatly when we move with the construction. Problem is we got 33 people. So we have to find somewhere else to park. And we need the city, uh, the infrastructure people, the DDA to help us figure out where are we going to put these people. I know there was a parking lot at Six and Williams. But that right now is impending on sale. That was our last hope. If we have to park on the streets, I'm going to ask the infrastructure committee if they can put in angle parking, which will give us more parking spaces on 7th and on Williams, but it will also cut down the traffic, so Williams will almost have to be a one-way street. That is something I don't know will be we've done, but I'm going to bring it up to the next infrastructure meeting if angle parking will help on 7th and on Williams. Thank you. And I'll talk more during the other times. Thank you. Keep bringing those ideas up. Uh, Mr. Asbury. Good evening, everybody. Clyde Asbury, 4135 South Fulton Place. I'm also here to speak on the truck issue regarding Normandy. Some of you know, but not all of you know, I am in the steel industry and I actually hire haulers to run heavy loads of steel plate all around the country. And I can tell you on no, in no uncertain terms, these trucks have no business being on any side street in Royal Oak. I would encourage you to frankly take a look at every half mile road we have, A, because of the recent paving that we're doing and the damage that these trucks do, and I'll get into that, but I don't think people really realize the amount of weight that we're talking about on these trucks. If you take the gold standard for a semi, your standard 18-wheeler, what that means is you have a trailer with four axles, four wheels per axle, and then your two front tires on the front of the uh, tractor. A typical weight for a tractor trailer is about 35,000 pounds, and then they can typically haul about 45,000 pounds. The gold standard nationwide is about 80,000 pounds that these trucks can carry. In Michigan, through legislation that was passed decades ago to appease the big three, you can actually haul with an eight axle truck. And the tear weight on those is up to 102,000 pounds and about 40,000 pounds in terms of the tractor trailer weight or about 140,000 pounds or if you want to equate it to a Chevy Equinox, that would be 31 Chevy Equinoxes. What happens to roads when you have this kind of weight going? What makes a road actually fail is you have what is called vibratory stress failure. And let's say that you have a 80,000 pound truck with four axles carrying the bulk of the weight. The first 20,000 pounds hits that cement slab, you get a little bit of a vibration. Then the second axle hits, that amplifies it. Then the third and then the fourth axle hits, and you get an amplitory effect in terms of what axles actually do to cement slabs. That creates those micro fractures that allows water to seep in there. And then like this gentleman properly pointed out, when you get to the early part of April, when water starts to unfreeze, if those of us who have studied chemistry know that water is the thickest at about 34 degrees, that's where you get the heaving. And that's actually why in Michigan we have frost laws, where in April you're supposed to have less weight on the roads to help eliminate the damage of these trucks. But what these trucks do to side streets and is is undeniable but more importantly when i get back to the what these trucks are carrying if you take a place like a flex gate they're hauling steel coils in there 
And if you have a steel coil or a series of steel coils on the back of one of these trucks and you have a failure in one of the restraint trains or what have you, coils are round, they roll. I've been in this industry for a lot of years and I've seen what happens when a 10 ton coil rolls over a car or rolls through a warehouse and it's never pretty. So I would urge you not only to take a look at this for Normandy and, and adopt the recommendation, but frankly, take a look at it citywide. And a lot of the cities that I go to, particularly smaller cities where you'll have big industrial interests, abutting neighborhoods, like we have in a few cases here in Royal Oak, the signage is so very clear. And, you know, not to pick on Flexgate, I'm not saying they're a bad operation, but if that was in another community that I do business with, the signage would be very clear that if you want to get to Flexgate from I-75, you're on 14 mile and that's it. And when you're done loading, you go back that way. If you're coming from the south, you're on cool, that's it. And you go back that way. There's no ifs, ands, or buts that these trucks are intersecting through residential neighborhoods in any way, shape, or form. So, sure, I'm going to champion my neighborhood, but really, this is a bigger citywide issue that I hope you folks would take a look at. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Esprit. All right, who's next? Who oh, are this gentleman over here? Good evening, I'm Alex Williams. Um, I represent Mitchum Chapel AME Church, 4207 West 14 Mile. Uh, I've been here a couple times before. The last time I think I, well, one of the previous times I mentioned some of the um, outreach activities that we're doing uh, after the fact. So this time I'm trying to get ahead of it. Uh, we have a, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? We're collecting uh, canned foods, uh, dry goods and such for Lighthouse of Oakland County. Again, they're one of our, our regular charities that we support. Uh, and I just want to share our hours that we'll be collecting the goods. If you want to come to the church, you can meet our pastor. I know he spoke at the uh, Memorial Day um, celebration, but uh, he will be there from 2, 2 o'clock, I'm sorry, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., Tuesday through Thursday, starting next week. Uh, so any day after that, we'll start with September because hours can, can change from month to month. But, but he has committed that time to, uh, to be at the church to to take those donations and, and have some time with whoever wants to bring them. So for those on the commission, anybody in the room or watching on TV, uh, be sure that if you want to give, please do come uh, Tuesday through Thursday, 10 to 2. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Williams. All right, I think I saw a hand right here. Yes, ma'am. Gail Mack, 4312 Beverly Court, uh, which is uh, near Normandy and Greenfield. So I'm impressed with the, the concerns and information that my neighbors have <coughs> shared. And I support um, all of those things. And I hope that um, you will consider strongly the signs for no through truck traffic. Thanks. Thank you. All right. I thought I, thought I saw. Yes, sir. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jerry Pesek. Um, I'm with the law firm Steinhardt Pesek & Cohen in Birmingham, Michigan, 380 North Old Woodward. I'm here tonight on behalf of the Alcus Invest Investment Group pertaining to item number nine, the Learn Equities License Agreement. And I'd also indicate uh, Lawrence Alcus, uh, one of the principals of the Alcus Investment Group, is also present in the auditorium tonight. We are here to express our support um, for the resolution that was proposed uh, by the city attorney and submitted to the council on August 20th, 2018, that resolution being to terminate the license agreement um, with Learn Equities, and we, with one caveat that I'll speak to in just a moment. Um, since 1978, the Elkis Investment Group has owned properties at 500 to 510 West Williams, uh, excuse me, West 11 Mile Road, 520 West 11 Mile Road, as well as the property across the street known as K&G Menswear. This is tens of thousands of square feet of retail office space in this area of 11 Mile, which is primarily dedicated to retail tenants. Um, Learn Equities uh, acquired their property at 422 West 11 Mile, uh, and this is at uh, on North, 
Willard Equities and the Alcus Investment Properties are separated by West Avenue. They acquired their property in 2008. Um, that property, which is a small triangle, which I know this body is familiar with, has effectively no ordinance permitted parking on that small triangle. Uh, and obviously, um, Learn Equities knew that when it purchased the property. In June of 2017, without any notice to the Alcus Investment Group, the city entered into a license agreement with Learn, uh, whereby it effectively turned west from a two-way street into a one-way street and established, eliminated uh, uh, parallel parking and, establ and established a, effectively what's a five-space parking lot, only, solely and only for the use of Learn uh, and its tenant, no advertising and their employees. Um, that we have had an on di ongoing dialogue with the city regarding this issue, uh, as, we, as well as with, with this commission, as well as with the city attorney, whereby we've indicated our strong opposition to that arrangement. Um, among other reasons, um, this is parking that's needed for the general public to utilize the retail stores. Um, the Elkis Investment Group is at a very, very difficult time, quite frankly, releasing uh, 500 West 11 Mile since that particular, um, since that parking was eliminated. Um, we are pleased with the proposal to terminate the license agreement that was submit, uh, submitted to the commission by the city attorney's office, and we support it with one caveat. We'd like to ask the commission, in addition to terminating the agreement, and then obviously that would turn these five, five spaces into spaces available to the public, that it put a limitation on it of one to two hours parking. Uh, that way it would be available for retail uh, uh, customers, uh, for, the retail for the retail operations that are there. This is a retail area primarily. It's not really an office area. Um, from an office perspective for, uh, for no advertising or for learn, um, there's no reason it seems to me why they can't do what virtually every other office building um, in Royal Oak does. There's parking structure a block away and certainly their employees who need to park all day can park in those parking structures. But again, we are supportive of the proposed resolution submitted by Attorney Gillum. Uh, with one exception, we believe that the spaces should be restricted to one to two hours parking uh, in order to accommodate the retail uses. Thanks. Thank you. I see a hand. Yes, sir. Okay. Peter Alter. I am the attorney for Learn Equities and for Rick Van House, the principal owner of Learn Equities. It's interesting to hear what Mr. Pesek had to say. Um, on the one hand, we in good faith entered into a agreement with the city last year, Learn did, um, in order to carry out that agreement, Learn spent $9,000 in good faith. Prior to that time, Learn did not have street parking, but Learn was able to park in a portion of the driveway that it had in its building. They had four, five, six spots, depending on the cars, the size of the car, and that's what they have had for 10 years. So as part of the deal, they agreed to close off the driveway at the request of the city. And in exchange, they got those cars, uh, they could park those cars in apparel in a angled fashion on the street. So they went from having five cars parked on their driveway to having a driveway closed, spending $9,000 or thereabouts, and in turn being able to park on the street. Now, kind of in a no good deed goes unpunished kind of category, the city wants to take away the parking and they don't get their driveway back. Obviously, that's not going to happen. And to add insult to injury, some would suggest that they should be restricted in a manner that no restriction exists now and no restriction existed before on that street to limit the number of hours of parking to make it more difficult for their people and their clients and customers to come by. Parenthetically, the building that's vacant, the property that's vacant that Mr. Elkis owns, that's been vacant for more than a couple of years. It has nothing to do with the parking spot, but I think the object here should be to be fair. We're not thrilled with the agreement. 
I am not thrilled as the attorney for LEARN. It involves indemnification by LEARN for the city, all kinds of provisions in there which we're not very fond of. Be that as it may, that's the agreement was signed. That was signed. We have lived by it. Contrary to some of the suggestions, there is a million dollars of insurance that has been provided by LEARN with the city as a co-insured or an additional insured protecting the city. Obviously, LEARN doesn't want to have to go out of pocket if something catastrophic happens. We're happy to try to reach another modified agreement with the city. We think it's possible. We have not had the opportunity to do that. But if the city is determined to go ahead and terminate the agreement, I think it should, it should go ahead and do that, return to the status quo to the extent possible that existed before that agreement was entered into, allow the parking on the street in whatever manner is uh, consistent with the way it was done before, not impose any additional obligations on learn or no advertising, who has, between given the time of year and given the period we're talking about, 10 to 15 employees, so hardly all of its people park there, but some do. There's other parking right there in the street. The area is both retail and office. Obviously, everybody knows that there are some offices there, including Learn. Mr. So, Mr. Alder, I do need you to finish your final thought, please. I will fi finish. Thank you. So, keeping in mind where Learn was when it bought the property, where Learn was when it agreed to make the agreement in good faith, we ask the city to proceed as it deems appropriate in good faith. We will not object to terminating the agreement as the city has proposed. It's not our first choice, but we will not object to it. We do object to any further modification as suggested by uh, Mr. Pesek. Thank you for your attention, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Anybody else wish to speak at public comment this evening? Going once, going twice. Oh, uh, well. Oh, sure. Yeah, if you could bring them up to, to City Clerk Hallis here, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, well, we're going to bring the discussion back up to this side of the table, which brings us to item number six, which is the approval of the agenda. I do know we had one request at public comment to add signage for Oktoberfest for the farmer's market, so I see Ms. Perush with the, uh, or Commissioner Perush with the um, first call here. I'll move approval of the agenda with the addition of two items. Um, the first one is the consideration of the banner over uh, Main Street for the Farmer's Market. And secondly, to allow me uh, 60 seconds to announce public meetings that are coming up before our next meeting for public comment on the design of the downtown park. Okay. And sure. hopefully earlier rather than later so people are still awake when they hear when those goals are. <laughs> Okay, and I, and I think as part of that, we can make that second part um, item number right before uh, item number eight, your okay. sixty second update. If if I can, if that's your interpretation, if that if I interpreted it correctly, yes, okay, that, that would be great. Thank you. All right, we have a second by Commissioner Lavasser. All right, discussion on the agenda. All right, with none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. Motion passes. We have an agenda. This brings us to the consent agenda. Are there any items that anyone wishes to pull off the consent agenda this evening? Commissioner Perush. I'll move approval of the consent agenda. We have a motion by Commissioner Perush, second by Commissioner Dubuck. Um, the consent agenda tonight consists of City Commission meeting minutes from the 13th. Uh, claims August 17th, 24th, and 28th. Approval of purchase orders, approval of Municipal Employees Retirement System of Michigan Retiree Healthcare Funding Vehicle, Withdraw an asset transfer agreement, approval of 2018-19 winter maintenance agreement with the Road Commission of Oakland County, authorization for staff to execute and discharge the subordination of real property liens associated with the housing rehabilitation program, and receive and file non-action items May 2018 revenue and expenditure variance summary report. Any discussion? All right, with none, oh, oh, Commissioner Gibbs. Can I just ask a quick question? Is this 18, uh, for the um, the winter maintenance agreement with the Oakland County Road Commission, is that $18,000 contract, regardless of how much it snows, if we get an extraordinary amount of snow, is this 18 grand? Yes, it's an annual agreement, okay. and 
if it doesn't snow at all, we get that money, and if it snows 50 times, we get that amount okay. of money. Okay, I, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Question. All right, any other discussion questions? All right, with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right, the consent agenda passes, which brings us to item number seven two, uh, which is uh, Commissioner Perusha's um, discussion on public meet upcoming public meetings. Do you want to do that as well as the farmers market banner issue at this time, so that they don't need to stay until the end as well? Yeah. Okay, I don't see any. It'll take here. two seconds. Okay, for let's do that. Them. Okay, in terms of the announcements concerning um, the downtown park, uh, all of you are aware that when we did the design work for the Normandy Oaks Park, there were a series of public meetings at the community center, which uh, the public was invited to, um, to put in their input and their ideas about what should go in, in Normandy Oaks Park. Um, the design process and the public input process for the downtown park, which is the two acres that's right here between the library and will encompass the city hall and the uh, old the current police station when they go away, is different in this as in this design process. Um, Noack and Frouse, who are working with us, are bringing the public opportunities for input into the downtown area. So there are meetings here in the downtown that people can attend and give their ideas, their drawings, their thoughts about what they would like to see in the downtown park. And they're coming up fairly quickly. One of them will be at Arts, Beats, and Eats. They will be in a booth somewhere, and I don't know where they will be, um, from 11 to 5 on this Friday. And you're welcome to come and see the pictures and give all your thoughts and ideas about the downtown park if you happen to be at um, Arts, Beats, and Eats on Friday from 11 to 5. Look for their booth somewhere. There will be two meetings on Saturday, September 8th. In the morning, they will be at Farmer's Market from 9 to 1. Uh, there again, they will have their drawings and their uh, big uh, pads of paper to take notes in some corner of the market. And if you come to the market, you can give your thoughts about what should be in the downtown park there. In the afternoon from 2 to 5, they will be at the Royal Public Library, someplace in the library. Um, so if you're coming down to the library or just downtown and want to stop in there, you can do that. That is Saturday, September 8th. And then the last one is uh, Wednesday, September 12th, there is a food truck rally at the Farmer's Market that evening from 5 to 9, and they will be somewhere in the Farmer's Market, and you can stop in then, grab something from one of the food trucks, and talk to them about your ideas for the downtown park. Those are four opportunities in here in the downtown to give your, your ideas about what should be in the downtown park. You don't necessarily have to be a resident. We are surveying visitors, we're surveying employees, we're, sur we're surveying vendors, we're surveying all kinds of people who use the downtown as to what they think would be appropriate for the downtown park. So take those dates are on the city website if uh, you haven't written them down, um, but they're coming up quick. They're coming up within the next two weeks if you can believe that it's gonna be September already. And, uh, but it's your opportunity to give us input. For Normandy Oaks, we had about 750 people show up and give us input. We want to at least mm. duplicate that process in this process, this design process. So don't hesitate to track down some of these people and give us your input. That's it. Okay, very good. Lots of good opportunities. We had great success with Normandy. Let's a slight update to it. Oh, oh. <laughs> sorry. Um, it was very difficult for us to find space at Arts, Beats, and Eats. So what's going to happen is they will be there from 2 to 3.30, and they will be sharing the first aid tent with the fire department. Oh. So, so that's the only spot, place we could find for them. But they will be at the first aid tent um, with the Royal Oak Fire Department. I don't know where the first aid tent is, but if you ask for it, I'm sure you'll find them. But they'll only be there from 2 to 3.30. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. All right, so that brings us to the other added item related to the sign for uh, the temporary uh, banner for the farmer's market to advertise the upcoming Oktoberfest. Um, I don't know how we kick this off. We have a description from Robin as far as what she wants to put up. Yeah, yeah. Robin, maybe you can come up and describe to us the situation. Okay, I actually have a copy of what it will look like. I can give you if you need it. Um, it would hang between our speeds and needs and the AIDS walk. So it will come down. It will be between uh, September 4th and the 9th. And it basically, 
It's um, to ever, it's our 19th annual event, and so it's basically to advertise the farmer's market. We're going to have a two-day event this time, so we'll go over Friday and Saturday from 4 to 11. Okay, any questions? Just as a reminder, it, the reason she's bringing this here is as commission policy that any first-time banner has to be approved by the commission. Okay. We've never hung a banner, and we're sort of thinking we're missing an opportunity. So you have your Swabian plaid here behind the beer. A little bit. Excuse me, folks. Did we miss you heard the, the word beer. Did we miss the part that it's a violation of the RSPC needs ordinance? It's it won't that. be then. It's after that. After that. After that, okay. and before uh, AIDS walk. Welcome, yes. Mr. Rasmus. <laughs> <laughs> Jack and doing great. It's a great show. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we don't have any concerns with our sign ordinances or anything like that at this point for a temporary sign like this, do we? Are there any challenges there uh, no, by passing the Planning Commission or anything? It's, it's, a, it's along the bad. public right of way. It's the city's, uh, city commission's discretion. Okay, good. Mr. Dubuck. Move for approval. Motion by Commissioner Dubuck, second by um, Commissioner Douglas. Discussion? Okay, with none, I think we'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion passes. We have a banner. Looks nice, by the way. Thank Good design work. Did you design this, Robin? With some help. All right, nice work. Okay. Wow, everyone's been very patient tonight. We thank you for that. Um, this brings us to item number eight, which is the approval of the July 2018 Traffic Committee resolutions. I sense Mr. Callahan is behind me. I wow. Good evening, Mayor. <laughs> um, traffic Committee uh, met on July 24th at 7 p.m. Uh, Dan Godek, the chairperson, is here tonight to answer any questions. Uh, we had four items on our agenda. Uh, the first item was to review uh, the request to put no truck signs on Normandy. The second review was to install stop signs on Gainesboro at University. The third item we discussed was to close 7th Street at Main Street. And the final item we uh, discussed was Woodside Road and traffic issues that that resident brought up there. Um, the resolutions are before you, what the traffic committee finally decided upon. Do we have any questions for Mr. Callahan or Mr. Godick? No questions? Oh. Oh, Commissioner Douglas. Well, just the, uh, the no truck signs on Normandy. Do we then pair those signs with some um, added police enforcement? The police are notified of all the new signs that we put up. There are also websites out there that uh, regularly request information from the city about uh, truck prohibited zones and things, and we give them that information. So we're actually going to reach out and contact them in advance to let them know that this is no longer a truck route or it's no longer a route the trucks can use uh, once the signs go up. So they get that information out to trucking companies uh, and they then change their routes accordingly, hopefully. Oh, okay. Mr. Gibbs. If I could ask a question about enforcement, um, would, how is it enforced? Would there have to be police officers at the end, either end of Normandy to catch these trucks doing it? Or could residents call with a license plate and the, the picture on the side of the truck and say this truck just drove down? Um, probably that would be re a question for the police department. Well, we, we handle traffic complaints all the time. Uh, someone, someone could call it in. We would put officers there to watch the area at, if we needed to. We'd do a detail if we needed to. Um, it would be addressed. But we, I mean, we could take complaints too and maybe do follow-up. But the most common practice would be just to put an officer in the area to watch. It's probably temporarily. Absolutely. Yeah. As needed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it's available. Oh, yeah, I know. Our studies actually did note the times of day when the mm -hmm. trucks were coming and going. Um, I'm not sure that it's the same every day, but we can forward that information along to them. And maybe if they're going to put a detail out there, they use that information to uh, select a time of the day they might see something happen. Mr. Lavasser. Uh, I'm going on, on the assumption that most of these trucks are heading to the Delamere area. Is that a fair assumption? We didn't follow them around. Uh, TIA only put up the sensors to measure what type of vehicles, how fast they were going, and the volumes. So um, 
obviously, uh, if you look at our report, the vast majority of trucks are actually going westbound on Normandy. There'd be uh, eight to 10 trucks going eastbound and 16 trucks on the two days that we measured going westbound. So more trucks going west towards Greenfield Road. Hmm. Is, is there some way that we could communicate with the uh, businesses in the Delamere area just to make sure that they're aware of these, uh, of, of, of this change if we adopt that tonight? We can certainly try to reach out to them. Mr. Pruch. The alternative route for a lot of these trucks, because we live close to Woodward, is to come off of 696 and go up Woodward to Coolidge and then Coolidge up to Normandy, either to Flexingate, which is where a lot of the steel trucks are going, or to some of the other businesses um, off of um, Delamere up there in the Little Industrial Park. Um, a lot of the um, FCA trucks tend to use Woodward as opposed to Normandy, but not the steel trucks. We see very few steel trucks, and my guess is that it's because they're all in Normandy. So there is, there is truck traffic, and they do have an alternative right to, to come down Woodward to get to 696 and then on to I-75. But um, clearly not all of them are doing that, and they're using Normandy as a cut through. And I think the problem is getting more exasperated because I'm sure all these guys have, you know, these optimized navigation systems, and, you know, they may have had a route planned, and then they go to their phone, and it's like, oh, well, you can take, you know, Normandy instead and save a minute and a half. So I'm sure the problem has been getting worse over the years, I believe it. Commissioner Perush. I'll move approval of, this, of all of these resolutions. Motion by Commissioner Perush, second by Commissioner Macy. Discussion? Yep. That I'll be supporting this. I think, um, you know, we made a little progress on Greenfield. Normandy's not an appropriate place to have these big trucks going down. Nothing against the trucking companies. It's just, you know, this is why we have this body here to regulate a little bit and make sure, um, you know, we all play fair by the rules. And, you know, we'll, uh, we'll see where the vote goes, but, um, you know, I'll be supporting it. So I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Godick, for your service on the traffic committee as well, as always. All right. This brings us to item number nine, license agreement with Learn Equities, 422 West 11 Mile Road. Mr. Gillen. <laughs> Mayor Forney and City Commissioners, uh, have you heard the comments from both Mr. Pesek and Mr. Alter tonight? They've set, between the two of them, they've set forth pretty much most of the relevant facts in this particular case. Uh, the other information I would add that is back in May, um, the City Commission had been provided with an update on this particular issue. Um, Mr. Twing had uh, provided a detailed summary of everything that had happened, which included input from both <coughs> Mr. Elkus and uh, uh, Learn Equities as to what uh, they each felt should take place going forward. At that time, the Commission had adopted a resolution um, that directed my office to amend the license agreement to restrict the use of the angle parking from by learn from five spaces to three, uh, which would have left two spaces for public parking. Um, we attempted to get a new license agreement with in place with learn equities. And um, I can go into the details of all the discussions and the emails that were exchanged. Um, but the bottom line is there are still significant differences between what we can recommend is to form and what Learn Equities have found to be acceptable. So based upon that, at this point in time, in the Commission's earlier action, our recommendation is that the license agreement be terminated. If you have specific questions or other questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those. Commissioner Macy. Um, about the, the, parking the parking area that was at Learn Equities before this agreement was put into place, um, I, no, I don't actually, I didn't, felt like that was sort of new information, but it made me think that maybe we'd heard before that there wasn't supposed to be parking there for some reason. Why did we remove the driveway and remove that parking? <coughs> well, according to the Community Development Department previously, um, Learn Equities or, or No Advertising, who's actually in the building, um, had been able to get as many as three vehicles on the property. Um, but um, while they were able to park vehicles on the property, 
while they were parked there, the vehicles were all extending into the public right away. So there was actually no legal parking, per se, under the ordinances. Um, when Sherman Drive was being reconstructed, based upon all the discussions that had taken place over the years between the staff and no advertising, uh, the re idea or the thought um, was developed on the city's end to put the angle parking in on the west side of West Street. Okay. Commissioner Dubot. All right, so if I'm understanding this right, um, where there were three um, non-compliant spaces uh, for the exclusive use of the tenants, really, there are now five public spaces. Is that right? Well, there are five angle spaces along West, but those are signed and reserved pursuant to the license agreement between certain hours, basically business hours, for purposes of learn equities only. Well, I mean, should we pass this uh, recommendation as you put it forward? It would basically, there would just not be five public spaces there. In 90 days, that's where, correct. Where there were three illegal privately used spaces. And two parallel spaces on the west side of West, west Street, which were public spaces previously. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, after, after notice is provided to learn, yeah, then the spaces, um, the five angle spaces will now be open to the public. That's correct. Um, yeah, I appreciate both attorneys coming out making their cases. I think, you know, in that we are back. Uh, dissolving this agreement, um, I think returning to the status quo, which is public parking. I don't see any reason to further restrict the parking. So I'll move for uh, the resolution as presented. Motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Douglas. Discussion? I had a, I had a question. Um, Ulkis mentioned wanting one to two hour parking for those five spots and maybe the two additional ones. If, if I can just ask, what are your hours of business? 10 to either 6 or 8 p.m. Okay, so later in the evening. A little bit a little bit later in the evening okay thank you would we I I admit I, I I'm not sure what the benefit of putting a one to two hour limit on these five spots would be and so but I, I, I wondered what their working hours were to see if or if maybe customers were coming in and out consistently that they would need those spots right. as well as with learn. I, I, I guess neither party really s specified that. I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to get a flow of traffic for, for both businesses, not tra uh, vehicle traffic, people traffic. Commissioner Dubot. Um, I think the primary concern for me is that before any of this took place, there were no spaces there for the use of the neighboring property. So now five public spaces have been created, um, in part due to the investment of LEARN properties, mm -hmm. in agreement with us, which we're now dissolving. So, I mean, they're kind of left holding the bag on that investment. Um, so five public spaces that weren't there are now there. I don't see any reason to restrict those spaces because the, the neighboring property, they didn't exist them before either so they have not been harmed in any way so that's why dissolving this is, is the motion on the table just per the recommendation of the city attorney and I, I understand and respect that I'm just trying to get a ter determination of as to why Elkis would want to specify a shorter period of time I, I, I guess it's a moot point but they don't want the employees to park there during the day. Right, and that would be the only th that yeah. that would be my biggest concern as well for the residents and the other businesses in the area. Commissioner sure Weiser, I, I suspect that we could always revisit the question of um, limiting the length of stays in those parking spots at a later date. We don't necessarily have to determine that today. Uh, and I would certainly, I, I'm going to support the motion uh, with, without putting a restriction on the length of stay at those parking spots. But certainly if we find that there's a problem going, going on down, down the road, we'd certainly want to revisit that. Yeah. I, I would agree. Like if we, I mean, right now, you know, we're trying to unwind something. We understand the reasons why we try to do something in good faith. And, you know, there's two parties there and 
now we're at the situation that we're at. Some spots have been created as a result of it, and at the end, if you know there's some sort of harm uh, that's uh, been proven, you know, for one of the properties, um, you know, that wants the restriction, then I think we can take a look at it then and see and and and, and evaluate it then. Uh, but right now, we don't have. You know, there's not grave cause to say that they're going to be harmed, in my opinion. But in the event that you know they are, let's take a look and, and you know see what it says down the road. But I don't, I don't see that you know forthcoming. But um, all right, any other discussion, Mr. Gillum? Just, just one comment. I mean, I certainly no expert in the functions of the traffic committee, but it seemed to me that if there is a question that arises about the use of those five spaces. Yeah. Maybe the traffic committee would be the appropriate route for that. Yeah, that would be so. the best place to go to get that, you know, that evaluation done. If, if there's a petition to do that, they can look at it and make that determination. That's a good point, Mr. Gillum. Um, all right. Any other discussion? With none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. That brings us to item number 10, the Construction Code Board of Appeals Ordinance Amendment, first reading. Mayor Forney and City Commissioners, um, there's been some recent discussion um, regarding uh, the status of the Construction Code Board of Appeals um, in regards to uh, a, a project that was approved by the Planning Commission, and it's been brought to our attention that the uh, Board of Appeals, uh, the ordinance provides for five residents, or if I'm sorry, five members. In fact, there are only three at this point in time. The reason there are three is because one of the prior appointees passed away earlier this year. Um, the other resigned after having moved out of town. So we're at a position now where the Board of Appeals has three members rather than the five, and the recommendation from the building department is rather than um, reappoint or appoint two additional members and take it back up to five given the fact that this board does not meet very frequently frequently and there are um, some uh, specific requirements that have to be met in terms of membership this isn't just a a, a random appointment there has to be some expertise um, in terms of the construction trades for the members that are appointed um, the ordinance would leave the membership at three which would mean that the board is, in fact, fully staffed right now. Uh, the other change that the uh, ordinance would make to the amendment is uh, the ordinance would provide specifically for a two-year term of membership. The ordinance currently doesn't provide for a term of membership, but that's because state law provides for a two-year membership as a default. So all, all we would be doing would be incorporating the default provision specifically into the ordinance to make sure that nobody has any questions about that. If you have other questions, I'd be happy to answer those. But we would recommend approval of the ordinance on first reading. Commissioner Perush? I'll move approval of this resolution on first reading. Motion by Commissioner Perush. Second by Commissioner Douglas. Discussion? Commissioner Dubuck? Um, yeah, I'm not quite following the rationale for the reduction in the size of the body. I understand they don't meet that often, but it does seem uh, if this is a residence. Uh, their course of action, if they disagree with the ruling of the building department, um, seems like as much public input in that process, the better. So was, how is it in the public interest to reduce this body from five to three? Um, first up, it's a very restrictive criteria. It's not like the zoning board or, or plan commission. There has to be a, there's only three criteria that you can appeal. One is that the code section doesn't apply. One is that it's being misinterpreted or that uh, you've provided equal or better means of compliance. So there's only, there's only three criteria that you can do. It is also difficult to staff this board. Um, you have to have somebody who is experienced in construction, architecture, engineering. So that was the rationale be behind reducing the number. Also, the board hasn't met since 2013. <laughs> That's why I couldn't find it on the agenda. So. That's why I couldn't find it on the calendar. It makes it hard to have strong feelings about it if it <laughs> five years. But <laughs> is there a reason that it hasn't met in so long? Is it just, are people need, aware of this process? It only yeah, they are. Somebody's appealing a decision. Are right. people made aware of this opportunity when they a decision is made? Uh, not with every decision, no. But 
the, the people who we make that decision to are very aware of the appeal process. It's it's plain in the code. It's right in the first section. And um, I think we compromise quite a bit to to try and find those middle points where, where the code is still being applied and safety is being preserved. But we can find a way to work through it. We've done that in several cases. So Is this the only appeals mechanism that people have? Or can they go down other routes? This is the first step in the appeal process. Yeah, if, if they're unsuccessful at our level, they appeal it to the state. And then from there, it would go to circuit court. OK. Mr. Lavasser. It wasn't quite clear to me, but when people are denied uh, the, the relief that they're seeking, are they made aware specifically in writing of their appeal rights? No, it's, it's their responsibility to be aware of the code. Um, I, I don't know of any instances where somebody's been denied and felt like they didn't, like they were at an impasse and didn't have any any other um, opportunity to, to correct the problem. I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but. It sounds like you're, you're not having too many denials that would trigger this? Correct. Yeah, I mean, I, if we deny something, I can point out in the code why it's denied, and it's clear. Commissioner Macy? Um, so I tend to agree with Commissioner Dubek. I, I haven't heard a reason other than that it hasn't met in a long time that we should be reducing the number of people who are making these decisions, which are important decisions for the community, from five down to three. Uh, it may be hard to fill, but we haven't even tried. I mean, do we, we, it hasn't come before the Appointments Committee. I think if this were to come to us after the Appointments Committee had met and said, geez, we just don't even have any candidates for this, maybe we are looking too big for this board. Um, but, as, but as it is, this seems like there might be a reason to have five people who are making these decisions, and maybe it would be time for some new blood since 2013 if, there's, if this um, is coming, coming into play again. So I don't understand... I don't understand the rationale that we are using, and I would say that a board of three is is a, a small, fairly small decision-making board to have um, for an appeals process. So I, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to be supporting this. Mr. Bruce? Um, it, it's not just recently that it's been hard to fill. It's been hard to fill perennially. I mean, it's been hard to fill for decades because it's very hard to get someone to commit to a board like this when they only are going to meet episodically. I mean, you're not talking about individual homeowners who are coming before a Board of Appeals. They are, these are licensed contractors who are coming before a Board of Appeals. So these are people who understand the code and they know how the city interprets the code because they worked in the city and they understand, you know, what is, what is appropriate and what is not appropriate. So the number of appeals are, are, are significantly, significantly smaller than your traditional like a zoning board of appeals, um, bec that because that's what you're dealing with here. Um, there used to be, as I recall, other types of boards of appeals for different trades, for electrical, I believe, and maybe for plumbing. And I, I don't know that those even exist anymore because um, th they were abolished in the state code, which is what creates this. And then those types of appeals just kind of went away and they're, they're handled in, in another manner. Maybe they're kind of all combined into this into this one um, but I, I mean this is this has been an issue for a long time and I, I think this is appropriate if you've got th three really good licensed contractors on this board they're more than capable of hearing an appeal and making a decision you got three panels of course of appeals throughout the state who make decisions every day on thousands of cases um, those are three judges you can have three talented people here doing the same thing at the state level, this is a three-person board that would hear these appeals. I don't believe there currently are any applications on file for this board. I, I could be wrong, but I don't believe there are. So, otherwise, I think they would have gone to the, the these two vacancies would have been brought to the attention of the appointments committee. But there are no applications on file, again, to my knowledge. So. So that's what I was going to ask, is that when I was on the Appointments Committee, no one told me, by the way, we've got two openings on this. It seems like something that we, I don't remember seeing it on the city website in terms of the openings that are available to be applied for as part of that. The other question I have is if this is um, this resolution goes through, would we be reappointing the three members? Because presumably they are far past their two-year term of office. 
So would we be starting from scratch and trying to appoint three members? I believe that you would, yes. Yeah, you'd have, there'd have to be initial appointments again to start the two-year clock running. Do we have a motion? You made the motion. It's late. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other discussion on it? So the motion on the table is to go with two years to comply with, well, to align, not comply. I mean, I guess you could make it a 10-year appointment or a five-year or whatever, but this de facto is two-year, right, Mr. Gillen? Correct. And then to um, go from five to three on this appellate board. Everyone understand the motion? Call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Okay, the motion passes. As a follow-up, I have a question. So the three members that have been on here that have not presumably reapplied, will they be reapplying for us to do at the next or the following appointments committee meeting? I think that's something that the appointees, the current appointees, need to be made aware of. It's all part of doing things by the book and, you know, we want to be transparent and following the rules, well, our own rules. When you can get a meeting put together, I've been trying for the last couple of weeks to... Uh, I'm aware of that, yeah. yeah. But we should probably send out a nice letter explaining, yeah. you know, the two-year requirement and, like, hey, why it was updated and everything. It's not a, you know, a knock against their performance, although it's hard to gauge their performance <laughs> since they've only met since 2013. <laughs> that one time... It shows how good they are. <laughs> Okay, all right, so that brings us to item number 11, the snow removal ordinance update report. We have to vote on that. Oh, we just did. Did we vote yeah. on that? Yep. How was the button then? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Mr. Gillum, your name is attached to this one as well. I'm not sure if I like the way you say that or not. <laughs> <laughs> that's correct. I'm I see your name in this doc, contained in this document, oh. Mr. Gillum. Thank you. Um, Mayor Fournier and City Commissioners, this is basically an update. Um, um, the, uh, the snow removal ordinance issue, I guess we'll call it that, resolution of that issue continues to be one of the City Commission's objectives for that particular year. So that's why I brought this ordinance back. Um, as pointed out in, in public comment, there are some similarities or actually uh, identical provisions in this ordinance. Um, as opposed to the one that was presented to you back last fall. Keeping in mind that the one that was presented to you last fall was for what's called the private clearance model, which makes it expressly or exclusively the homeowner's responsibility to clear snow and or ice from the sidewalks that are adjacent to their, the, I'm sure I should say the property owner's responsibility to remove snow or ice from the uh, sidewalks that are adjacent to their property. Um, the direction that I received from the commission at that time was to develop something more along the lines of a combined clearance model where some of the responsibility falls upon the city and some of the responsibility falls upon the property owner. So that's the most, I think, significant change and that's most primarily what I was looking for input from the commission on in this particular draft. Um, the uh, draft would um, designate zones within the city. The exact designation and specification of the zones remains to be determined, but depending upon where the zones were, property within the zones would, uh, clearance of snow and ice within those zones would be a higher priority than within other zones within the city. Um, our thinking in putting the draft together was that, again, keeping in mind that I, as we understand it, the the goal of this ordinance is to uh, further promote the city's interest in mobility uh, throughout the city. Um, the central business district, which is currently cleared by a city contractor, would be the highest priority and would continue to be cleared by a city contractor. Um, other areas would have to be designated. Again, our thinking was that perhaps the next Highest priority would be residential areas, um, thinking that we'd be wanting clearing s snow to and from and around the schools. 
maybe we're painting with a broader brush. I don't know. I'd, I'd be welcome to, to any input from the commission on that. We'd also have to provide for the clearance of snow in commercial areas, but again, in our view, depending upon the commercial areas outside the CBD, those would not be a, as high of a priority as some other areas would be. For example, the industrial areas up uh, on the north end of town, maybe along 14 Mile or something like that. The snow should be cleared, but does it need to be cleared as quickly as the snow in the CBD or is the snow in some of the residential areas of the city? And then for the areas that aren't specifically defined, we do have a, a catch-all zone, and that would be basically whatever is left. So um, in terms of some of the specific points that were raised during public comment, number one, uh, the ordinance does say in big, bold letters on it that this is just a draft. Uh, we're not action for any, acting for, asking for any action by the City Commission tonight. We're asking for more input um, to make sure that we're headed in the right direction. Um, as I indicated to you last fall, really the, the nuts and bolts in this, in my opinion, is the designation of the zones. And before we spend a lot more staff time trying to figure out which zones should be where and trying to define those zones, we wanted to get input from the Commission and to make sure that we were headed in the right direction. Um, as to the question about the 36-inch clearance, that comes from the Americans with Disabilities Act, not specifically to snow and ice on sidewalks, but 36 inches is the standard for clearance under the ADA. So that's why we incorporated that standard into this ordinance. In terms of the time frame, again, the time frames are open to discussion if you have comments on those. Um, but again, we felt that um, there has to be some fairly prompt time frame in here where it somewhat defeats the purpose of having an ordinance to remove the snow. I mean, if you wait long enough, pretty much all the snow is going to melt anyway. And if that's the position we want to take, then why do we even bother to have our snow removal ordinance in the first place? Um, as to the question of the penalties in here, um, I do recall the discussion about the penalties last year. Um, but uh, two comments as to that. Number one, the penalties that are provided in here are maximum penalties. So for the first violation, a civil infraction with a fine of up to $100. Um, the second, within six months, a fine of up to $250. Um, generally what happens is when a new ordinance is enacted, um, the district court takes a look at the violation and sometimes with input from our office or input from other city departments, they set a scheduled fine, which is often less than the maximum fine. Um, so again, these are talking about maximums, but if the Commission sees fit, we can lower the maximum fines as well. Um, as to the question of ice, um, I, I'd acknowledge that ice is problematic, um, but in my opinion, in some ways, ice is a bigger impediment to mobility than snow is. In fact, maybe ice on the sidewalks is more dangerous than having some snow. So I think we need to allow for ice in here, and the cleanest and simplest way that we felt to deal with that was to provide that um, any accumulation of ice has to be removed within a specific time frame. Um, I think we have to keep in mind that there is going to have to be some common sense that's going to be used in terms of the enforcement of this ordinance. Um, we're also going to have to use common sense. Someone raised the question of the seniors, and that's something we also talked about in our office. The people that are seniors or maybe people that are disabled, they're not able to comply within the time frames that, that this ordinance would provide for, and we'll have to use some judgment in terms of when tickets are issued and when tickets are not issued. As far as I'm concerned, the intent of this ordinance would be to deal with the chronic violators, the individuals that never want to clear the snow and ice from their sidewalk. Everybody else, we, we probably all have people in our neighborhoods that are like that. There may be one or two properties in the whole block that never touch the snow or ice, but everybody else normally does a pretty good job of it. So. That's the thinking anyway. So again, I'm looking for input. If you have specific comments, I'm happy to take those. No offense taken if you disagree with any of our analysis. But again, I'm anxious to hear what you have to think. Again, we would like to have a snow ordinance in place before the snow starts to fly this fall, if we're going to have one. So again, I'm open to any comments. Okay. So quick question for you, Mr. Gillum, just as it relates to the fines. Um, 
currently today, if somebody is parked over the sidewalk, like they park their vehicle on the sidewalk, what is the fine for that? Um, you know, I'm not sure. There, that's probably one where there is a scheduled fine for, for blocking the sidewalk with a car, but I'm not sure what it would be. Okay. Well, maybe offline I can get that. Because I think to me that's, you know, for saying $100, you're essentially blocking your sidewalk from somebody, you know, walking across it, blocking it via snow. And then if, you know, there should be some parity, you know what I mean, I would think, as a basis for fines. So it would be interesting to know any other, if you if you block off your sidewalk, today, you know, either with a dumpster or with a car or, you know, something else, what is the penalty mechanism we have in place if that sidewalk is impassable? I think there's a specific violation for parking your car along this, across the sidewalk <coughs> under the Motor Vehicle Code. Right. Um, but I think in terms of putting a dumpster or something like that, uh, something else like that, blocking, that would be a different violation that I believe is a misdemeanor, but I'm not sure. Okay. So. Some hands up here. Um, I just have a couple of concerns, and I don't have any magic answers to any of these. Um, the first one is the 24-hour um, uh, limitation for getting the snow off the sidewalk. Um, a lot of us who are seniors rely on third-party contractors to remove the snow because we can't do it by ourselves, especially when there's an accumulation. I mean, we can do a small accumulation, but if it's four inches or more physically, we generally can't do that and we have a whole ton of them on our block. Um, and typically when you get a large snowfall, it is more than 24 hours for a lot of um, those companies to get to everybody on their list. Um, and so the 24 hour time frame for a lot of people is gonna be very, very, very hard to comply with um, because they rely on third party snow removal contractors. They're not doing it by themselves. We would love to have our driveway cleared in 24 hours but when you have a really heavy snow, we always have to rely on the fact that that's probably not going to happen. Um, the second thing is the definition of ice. Frequently when you get a smaller accumulation of snow, like one or two inches, and it's just kind of packed down on the sidewalk and you don't really clear it very much because you don't need to. You know, people can walk easily back and forth on your sidewalk with just an inch or two sidewalk. But with enough sunshine and then cold nights and then more sunshine and cold nights, you'll get these little icy patches throughout the whole length of your sidewalk, especially when there are, where there are footprints. You'll see icy footprints all along. If there's a requirement that you have to clear all the ice off your sidewalk so that you have a 36-inch path for people to walk, you're essentially going to be saying to these people, you have to get down to the pavement um, in order to comply with the ordinance. I don't think that's realistic. I mean, none of us want to walk on icy sidewalks, but on the other hand, um, the way this seems to be structured now, uh, you're going to have to clear off all the ice, and I think that's just going to be impossible and impractical for a lot of people um, in the community. So I think more thought needs to go into the ice issue. Again, I, I, I don't have a magic answer as to how you deal with that, because I clearly icy sidewalks are, are very treacherous. <coughs> Bless you. But I, 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 I'm not so sure that n requiring that everybody get all the ice off their sidewalks is realistic. Those are my two comments. I, I have other little thoughts, but those are the two big ones. Commissioner Dubuck. Uh, so yeah, I'm still really struggling with this. I feel like uh, when the conversation initially began, I think the first time I looked at this was well over two years ago, three years ago. Was and I think the city's visited this multiple times over the years, right? That's correct. Uh, we were talking we, about we access. We talked about it when I was here several years ago, then I left for a couple of years, right. and I came back, and it's still here. <laughs> right, because we know how much they judge. Yeah. So, you know, we were talking about major commercial corridors, access to transit, because for some people that's their livelihood and safe access to, you know, transit lines. Uh, you know, folks have the perception that no one uses the buses, but, I mean, if you look around as you're driving around the city, there are quite often people at the bus stops. Um, it's not as important, but, you know, when I'm, I'm looking at this, I'm th looking at 24 hours or even, you know, 48 hours for any number of reasons, people aren't going to be able to comply with that. They're, they're out of town when it snows and, you know, I'm not going to, every time I go visit my mother for a weekend, right, have a contractor on call because there aren't contractors on call for right. one-off jobs like that. Um, so I'm thinking of hundreds of incidents where we may very well solve the problem and make sure people's walks are cleared. Um, for those, you know, few people that were trying to get to comply in residential areas, 
but hundreds of people are going to be caught in this net who generally do do the right thing and for one reason or another didn't comply. And, and I envision it as, as just a, an enforcement nightmare that's going to cause a lot of uh, anger among residents who nine times out of ten are doing it right. So, and I don't know how to write an ordinance or how you could write an ordinance that forgives that one time out of ten where I didn't get to it because I had to rush off to work really early, you know, and, and, I, I, and, and the ice things, we had that issue last year where when, what are we going to do about major weather events where we had, where we, we had like two feet of snow and then it became 60 degrees and then it became 20 degrees and the entire city was under about two inches of rock solid ice. Um, I mean, obviously we could just not enforce, but then what's the point of having the ordinance? But people trying to dig out from under that couldn't do it. Um, it it's, if there's a way to talk just about the commercial corridors uh, where people have, you know, there's necessary access to, um, you know, businesses and services that people need to be able to get to if you're using a wheelchair, if you're using a walker, um, uh, that, that's kind of where we were. And... This feels so all-encompassing. I don't know that we'll, with this model, get to a place where I'm going to be comfortable voting for it because I think we're going to cause a lot more problems than we solve with this approach. Although I pr appreciate the work. I mean, you're, you're getting closer to what we've been talking about, I think, but just as it takes shape, I just, for every one problem we've fixed, I see five more popping up. Commissioner Macy. Yeah, so I agree with that, and I, I wasn't around when the, this, for this idea first came forward, but um, I think, not to continue my contrary streak tonight, but I think I'm just anti-snow ordinance. Um, I don't, it doesn't seem like the right, it doesn't seem like a stick is the right, right tool for this kind of a problem. It's, I think we've all said already, people generally try to clear their walks, people who are able to do it, do it, as, do it in a timely fashion. Um, and it's, there's a very small number of people who are these chronic offenders who don't do it, and even they may have a good reason um, that we could perhaps be helping them with rather than be charging them fines for. Um, so I, if it were up to me, I would say no ordinance at all, but maybe come up with some kind of a plan. Is there some kind of a line to report in for these people who have problems? Can, can we reach out to them and find out what their problems are? Can we talk to their neighbors? Can we get some kind of a, a safety net for those people who need help with their show, snow shoveling without hitting them up with fines and then hitting up all these other people who are caught in the net when they go up to their mothers or go away for the weekend? Um, so just I'm going to be voting against this. I think generally this is not the right tool to be using for this, and I... I apologize for all the work you did. So you're a snow. <laughs> oh, God. I'm a snow on the snow ordinance. One, one dad joke per night I'm allowed. Okay. That was, that was Commissioner Douglas. Mr. Gillum, question. If we have a snow ordinance, must it be comprehensive? That is, if we're going to do it, do we have to cover every part of the city? <clears throat> well, if the goal is to increase and allow for mobility, I don't know how you can distinguish between residential areas, for example, and commercial areas. Uh, what if you could base it on traffic? I mean, we have, I mean, there are the, the engineering department or the state has levels of roads, if it's a collector or a residential or, a, I mean, there are ways to categorize streets. I mean, and, and, and I will, I mean, I'll, I'll say that, I mean, and I, I'm one of the people behind this. Um, I'm not interested in turning neighbors against neighbors, but um, before my mother-in-law passed away, she lived with us, and she used to like to walk to the Rite Aid store at uh, Catalpa, Gardenia, and Maine. And, you know, come winter, the Rite Aid wouldn't plow its sidewalks, and, I mean, they would be piled up with snow, and the corner would be piled up with more snow. She couldn't go to the drugstore. I mean, I think seniors and people should be able to get to um, and commercial corridors and be able to access transit. Um, and my interest all along has been addressing those main streets and, and we could, you know, enumerate them pretty quickly if we wanted to, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, Campbell, uh, Rochester, Maine, Crooks, Woodward. I mean, I, uh, me, I would be satisfied with that. I think that it's not a perfect solution. It doesn't solve every problem, but it solves a lot of problems. And, and, and that would be what I would advocate for. I think just a couple comments from my side real quick. 
Um, you know, what Mr. Gillum said, you know, it really does boil down to a few of the properties that, you know, consistently we've witnessed anecdotally in the neighborhoods where you go for a run, you go for a walk, and it's always like this house, you know, where, and I'm not, I'm just saying maybe in our case, our experience where you have, you know, five young people living together and it doesn't seem like one of the five can pick up a shovel and get the job done. Um, and that's really annoying because, you know, a lot of us that, uh, you know, unfortunately don't have, you know, four young men living in our house, you know, still have to go out and shovel our driveway, maybe some of our neighbors' driveways and, and um, sidewalks. The, the thing that's missing in this equation to me is, and I, I don't want to study everything to death, but, you know, is this an issue where, um, you know, 40% of the properties aren't clearing the snow? Is it a situation where 10% of the properties aren't clearing the snow? Um, you know, I'm not trying to kick the bucket down the road, but it'd be helpful to understand in these zones, you know, is it always the right aids that don't? Is it the commercial district, you know, that where we have issues? Um, understanding if it's a problem, if it's, you know, what the scale of that problem is, I think is helpful because that should determine our approach. Because if it's a very small number of properties that continue to endure this, there might be issues where people do have, um, you know, uh, issues taking care of their own sidewalk and, and maybe instead of penalizing and adjusting the ordinance, we can just go talk to them and do what neighbors should do and try to figure that out. Or if it's systematic, you know, nobody cares about anybody anymore and it's a sign of the apocalypse and 70% of properties aren't getting, their sidewalks aren't getting, you know, the snow isn't getting removed because nobody gives a heck about the next guy. Um, okay, then we have to take action and legislate and make sure that we, um, you know, have a, have a policy here to take care of, you know, what we should be taking care of as responsible neighbors. Um, that's where I struggle with. I do like the idea of maybe doing something on the commercial corridors. Um, I think there's a um, fair play there because there is so much traffic. Um, but, you know, when I look at it and I'm picturing my street and I try to forget winter by June, but, you know, thank you for bringing this to the table so we can look forward to what's coming. Um, you know, it's, it's a handful of properties that I see, and, you know, there may be issues. Like Commissioner Dubuck said, they left town, you know, they um, are in the hospital, you know what I mean? I think the $100 fine out of the gate, I mean, if the commission decides to go with some, you know, method here, I think that's a little strong. I think a warning, a small fine, you know, maybe a little courtesy if you need help. You know, there are these programs available. There are contractors, you know, there's Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts that volunteer to do this, whatever it may be. You know, we try to help versus, you know, have more of a carrot as opposed to a stick. Um, but for me, and I know I can't do it right now, but I'd be very interested in understanding what we think the percentage of properties that aren't complying to it. Commissioner Prush. Um, two things. In terms of the commercial corridor aspect, um, there are certain areas, there are certain streets in the city which are purely commercial, like 11 Mile, uh, Woodward Avenue, but Woodward is a different category altogether. But a lot of major streets are pri primarily residential. 12 Mile is primarily Campbell. residential, so is 13 Mile, so is 11, it's not 11 Mile. Um, so if you designate the whole street as the commercial corridor that has to be cleared, you're going to be catching with that an awful lot of residential properties. Still have the same yeah. issues. Yeah. So, so my thought would be if you're going to re if you're going to target people, you can target commercial properties. But I don't know if that's fair or even legally appropriate to do um, because it's a specific type of, of property and you're kind of singling them out um, for for special enforcement. Um, and then it gets and then it gets even trickier. Um, people who are like the Rite Aid store, which is the the confluence of three different major streets where plowers are going all the time, plowing different times of day, and clearing at different. Does that make it more difficult for Rite Aid because of its its specific location and the way the plows hit that intersection? I think it's entirely possible. So um, and the sidewalks are so close to the street. Um, I don't know. Yeah. I, I well, that's actually a good point if they shovel their sidewalks within the time frame and then the plows come a day later and kick well, up all the snow onto and, the sidewalk. That's and that was, that was the last point I was going to make. That happens in, in, that happens in residential neighborhoods. I mean, you, you, you're diligent and you get out there and you plow your sidewalk and then 
you know, five hours later, here comes the plow and throws the snow, or at least part of it, back onto your sidewalk. So are you, are you in compliance because you did shovel, or are you out of compliance because, guess what, there's more snow on the sidewalk now? I, I, I think it's just, a, an, as Commissioner DeBuck said, an enforcement nightmare. That's especially a problem when we've had a lot of snow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have to switch to the front mounted, the big blades. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, you can only push it with the undercarriage blade a few times. And when you put the big blade on, it throws the snow a lot further. And yeah. It will definitely go on the sidewalk. Sure. And it's packed solid, full of ice. Other stuff. <clears throat> yeah. Commissioner Douglas? Yeah, I acknowledge that there are, and I, I don't want to say commercial corridors. I want to say main streets or collector streets or whatever the, the proper designation. But yes, I acknowledge there are private homes on those streets, um, and they would need to, comp I would expect them to comply with the ordinance. I mean, I don't think you can say, well, the, the doctor's office next to you has to clear their sidewalk, but your house next to it doesn't. Um, that would be an obligation. Um, to the mayor's point that, you know, we need to see if this is a problem, I would say if it isn't a problem and we pass the ordinance, then we don't aren't out enforcing it. But if it is a problem, we'll have an ordinance that can deal with it. I mean, other than that, we're waiting until next winter where we go drive up and down Crooks and Maine and Rochester and, you know, count the number of businesses or, or properties that haven't shoveled their sidewalks. Um, an ordinance is probably a lot faster, easier, cheaper way to make that happen. Any other discussion? Mr. Gillum, I think you have very clear, concise <laughs> direction. <laughs> <laughs> There's no man that's up for that other than you, right? I mean, I mean, the, the other option, which would be kind of a radical shift from what we've talked about doing is, um, I mean, we could handle snow removal issues similar to the way that we handle code enforcement complaints now. Um, I mean, we would have an ordinance in place, but um, I expect that enforcement would largely be complaint-driven then. And then we could have some kind of a process where we could, like we do with code violations, property maintenance, other property maintenance issues, we send out written notification to the property owner. They have X amount of time to resolve the problem. If they don't resolve the problem, they get cited. Um, well, that, that's kind of one thing I was thinking in my, my mind is if it's the habitual folks that constantly have the issue, then um, if you made the time period longer, right, you know, and you said, okay, you have um, 48 hours or you have, you know, four days to remove the snow and you had it when only people called, the neighbors are going to call on the folks that, you know, have had a pile of snow on their sidewalk for, you know, three weeks, you know what I mean, and haven't done anything. And then we can send code enforcement out there and find out, okay, hey, what gives? And maybe in the short term, we also get some important data points uh, from code enforcement. And Jason's looking at me, he's like, more no stuff way. to enforce. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know you came out here, I was like, oh, man. Um, but, you know, maybe that gives us a little bit of a stronger baseline to make a, a better decision uh, for the following winter, just to kind of see how many complaints we get, you know, what the public reception and feedback is. Because you're going to have two schools of thought. Obviously, you're going to have people that are impacted negatively. They get a, a ticket or get a warning or a citation and, you know, oh, I'm angry or, yeah, you're right. Um, and then you're going to have the folks that are like, come on, I really, like, we get, we feel complaints. I mean, I get complaints. Like, why can't, isn't there an ordinance? So don't the neighbors down the street have to clear their sidewalks so, um, you know, we can pass? And so I take the easy way out in the middle of the night, I go and clear it. <laughs> so I don't have to deal with the complaint. But that's not solving the problem. Um, I don't know. Well, well, maybe instead of maybe you have an ordinance that doesn't even provide for a fine, it provides that it's like we do with tall grass. The notice goes out. There's a specific amount of time to take care of the tall grass, or in our case, to get the sidewalks cleared. If they don't get cleared, then it goes on a list, and DPS goes out and does it. Now Greg's going to be mad at me, too. I know Jason's <laughs> He's going to pop out of here anyway. <laughs> um, It'll melt before they get out there. <laughs> but, um, you know, DPS goes out as time allows, and uh, we bill the property owner. That gets the problem taken care of, if that's the goal. 
and there is a penalty in the sense that the city's cost would be passed along to the homeowner. Mm -hmm. But they get professionals that come out and remove the snow with great, you know, expertise, right? Yep, they got those 36 inch wide shovels, that's right. <laughs> so. I, I, le I, I would, you know, be more likely to support something like that where we mirror it similarly to what we do with tall grass where if there's a problem and an issue, neighbors can call in and we can go out and investigate, see what's going on and provide that individual help. And I imagine with tall grass, we have issues with seniors and people of low income that are hard up. And I know our code enforcement team works with them and tries to figure out solutions. So maybe that's a better approach. And if we get 62,000 of those complaints this winter, then okay, maybe we have to rethink and and retool and, and try something different. But I'm more apt to support something like that right away to get more information. But I'd like to see what the impact on staff would be and what the impact on code enforcement would be. I mean, I figure if we have people out there doing tall grass in the summer, maybe they look at tall snow in the winter, you know, and kind of manage those similarly. So I like that idea, Mr. Gillum. All right. Problem solved. So would the commission like me to put something together along no. those lines Please. for further discussion? F feel free to take Saturday off because you had such a good idea. Okay. <laughs> An ice for tonight? Oh! <laughs> Got it. Don't start. Oh, Randy. man. Now, now, he's, right. now he will continue until he has one, too. <laughs> Doesn't help. Like I got one. I'm not going to say it, though. <laughs> Don't say it. I, now I can tell it's offensive. Don't say it. <laughs> well, now the timing passed. I can't. All right. Let's, um, okay. I, so I appreciate all the input. Thank you very much. You're, you're so. welcome, Mr. Gilman. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> you're here every other Monday night. <laughs> 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 Try the meal. Yeah. All right. That brings us to item number 12, securing residential construction and demolition sites, ordinance 246, suggested revisions. I see Mr. Craig yep. is here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the city commission. Uh, I went back and reviewed the July 23rd city commission meeting. And what I got from that was that you kind of wanted a maybe a conversation starter on some some things that I saw in the ordinance that uh, we could could do to maybe make it a little easier to enforce and um, easier to comply. So uh, I, I listed four things here. The first is uh, that all the temporary fencing must be removed prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy. That clears it up that it does have to be gone uh, before a certificate of occupancy can be issued. Um, the second is that temporary fencing may be removed after the completion of an insulation inspection. Um, the, the theory behind that is that's the, the last time that I'm out there uh, before the final. Okay. I'm not out there any time in between the insulation and a final. So that was the so uh, that thoughts point, for that. The house is enclosed. Mm -hmm. The house is enclosed. At that point, though, you will still have porta johns on site. You will still have dumpsters. Um, a lot of builders will keep them there until the very end. So if the goal is to enclose the dumpsters and the porta johns, then there's no sense talking about taking it out before a certificate of occupancy. But that seemed to not be the direction that everybody wanted to go in. So you were looking for an earlier point, and this is the, um, the point that I can document is after an insulation inspection. So, so anybody who doesn't know, we do a rough inspection on the framing, then we do an insulation inspection, and then that's when they put drywall in. So, um, and then they start their finishes. Uh, also, I, I think it's important that we should be exempting detached accessory structures from, the, from this ordinance. I'm, I'm having a lot of times to explain to people just to take down a garage, which will take them a half a day. They have to apply for a construction fence, it has to be approved. They have to install it. We have to come out and inspect it, and then they can take down a garage. Same thing with putting one up. It, they, they usually go up pretty quick. They're, they're, we're not seeing where their materials are impacting the neighborhood in any way. A lot of times you might not even know that your neighbor's putting one up, but you see this construction fence and wonder what they're doing, and they're doing a garage that you can't even see. Um, and then the other would be exempting renovations or additions under 50% of the original building. Uh, I think if somebody's doubling the size of their house, that's a significant renovation that's going to take a, a period of time that would probably warrant the fence. Um, but anything less than that, I, I don't know that it has an impact on the neighbors and might not require it. So those are my four for 
sake of starting the conversation, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mr. Craig? Uh, Commissioner Pruch? Number three, exempting detached accessory structures. I, I interpreted that, what you meant differently. Do you mean that when the job is a new garage, they don't have to put a fence around it, they can just take it down and put it back up? Or when they are doing a total renovation on a house or, or building a new house, the fence has to enclose the garage even though they're not touching the existing garage? Right now, they would have to do that for both. If they're if they're building a new house and putting a garage there, they would have to enclose the whole site. Um, but this was sp meant specifically for the instances where people are just doing a garage at an existing home. Okay, so if they are doing a new house, but they're not touching the garage, would the garage have to be within the fenced perimeter? It wouldn't have to be, but a lot of times it's going to be because they're going to use the existing fence that's there on the sides and in the back and then just run their fence out around the front. Okay. So they, they will still be, I mean, they're, they're, cap they're capturing the garage whether they mean to or not. Right. It would be harder to not capture it. Right. Okay, I can I understand <coughs> those situations. But if for some reason the lot is big enough and the garage is separate enough from the property and they're only doing renovations on the house, they could, they could in some situations be exempt from putting the fence all the way around the garage just because of where it's located? They would be right now. If they were doing just an addition on the home, mm -hmm. we would require them to enclose the home just in the work area. Okay. If they okay. weren't touching the garage at all. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. Commissioner Gibbs? Would, would there be, there probably would be a dumpster, but would there be a porta potty for a garage teardown and rebuild? No. I, I, yeah, I wouldn't think so. That would be uncommon. And and the dumpsters aren't usually there for more than a day, right? Correct. Right. Yeah, in a garage teardown, they're pretty quick. Yeah, right, for a garage. So I, I, I'm just trying to get the timelines in place here, so I have no problem with this. Commissioner Dubuck. Sure. So and as we've been working through the this ordinance over the last couple of years I think getting to this place where we have the solid fence has been tremendously popular amongst residents the goal is really to keep the site on the site you know we were having sites kind of like trickle out into the sidewalk and even into the street with where they were stacking materials and where the porta potty was and everything so I don't want to retreat from that at all but I do want to make sure that what we're doing makes sense and that we're not being overly burdensome to a resident who's doing a really simple project so it feels to me like we are trying to get at with these recommendations is that right I'm, I'm trying to follow your direction and okay. provide some. <laughs> so um, just with regard to um, uh, giving, giving them the permission to take down the fence after insulation inspection. So plumbing and electric and everything's done. That's, so that's the last thing to be done before drywall goes up your set. The, the rough parts of the plumbing, electrical, and mechanical would be done. They, they do still have finishes to do, but okay. uh, everything is enclosed inside the building at that point. But you're, you're past a place where there would be tons of, you know, say, brick or siding or is anything else stored on the property no there could still be exterior materials stored on the property okay where, where they're at on the inside and where they're at on the outside don't always have anything to do with each other so i'm worried then that if we get to a place where now you we go from having these nice fences that i think everyone as far as i talk to folks feel they're doing their job now we have months of construction sites spilling out into the public right-of-way again is that I don't know that we had a problem with bricks and siding spilling out. It was usually the lumber packages get dropped off, mm -hmm. and they have they have limited lots, and they're trying to frame and drop lumber at the same time, and then trusses show up, and typically it was the trusses that would be hanging over the sidewalk. We have to get them to unpack the trusses, move them up against the house, and lean, which is what they don't want to do. They want to keep them there until they can put them on the on the structure. Do we need to make it clear that when the fence comes down that the site must remain on their side of the public right-of-way, not obstructing the sidewalk in any way? We will be enforcing that. We don't ever let them put anything out on the sidewalk. All right. Um, and this, I think one of the issues that was raised by one of, one of the developers in town was that uh, prior to one of the issues he was having was he had to do his landscaping, but he, he couldn't take his fence down. So this is going to fix that, right? Landscaping will not have been done at this point. It would be unusual to be ready for landscaping before insulation. So how much time do you think we're talking about on average, like a new build, 
that the fence will be down before everything else is complete. Can we put a time on it? Once your fence comes down, you have X number of days to get your CFO. The, depending on the the size of the house that's being built, I I wouldn't know what time frame to put on that. I have trouble getting caught. That's a <laughs> that's a pretty big window that. Mm. I'm I'm a little concerned about retracting on what, what I think has been really successful. Um, exempting you know folks doing small projects is fine, um, but uh, I don't want to be I don't want the fences coming down when you still we have still three months of an unfinished house uh, with builders coming and going with porta potties with dumpsters. Ninety days is a very realistic, uh, and that might be on the low side of of them completing. Hmm. Well, that gives me some concerns. I'm not sure what to do about that. And you're saying without doing an extra visit, this is the most logical place to tell them they can take their fence down. Or another point, I don't know what point you would want them to, to or allow them to take the fence down because they're still going to have dumpsters out there. They're still going to have porta johns. I mean, until the day they sell it, they will do that. Sure. I mean, I want to get to a place where you're as close to done as possible, basically, when you're ready to do your landscaping. So once, at least the way it was explained at the last, when, we, when these issues were raised. Well, that's a moving target that anybody can pick. I mean, you, sure. once, as soon as you're done with the exterior of your house, you can start landscaping. Right. So if somebody wants to get rid of their fence, they're going to say, I need to start landscaping now. Right. You could actually do the landscaping before you get the insulation done and everything. Yeah. So yeah. They're not dependent on each other. Uh, I think, I mean, I think definitely the first... Um, Actually, I think all of these are pretty good suggestions, uh, Mr. Craig. I think, yep, there are going to be those nuances where you have the guy that, you know, takes a little extra time and has his siding and a yard that's full of dirt, clumps of dirt, because for whatever reason, ran out of cash, left town, did whatever. But I think a majority of builders are highly incentivized to, you know, liquidate that home. I mean, they're tying up all their cash. Uh, of course, we've seen here at the commission <laughs> a vacant house in particular in the, you know, northwest uh, side of uh, Royal Oak that, you know, the market principles and rules don't seem to apply to that ownership. Um, but I think in the broad perspective of thing, we can't, you know, fix every single issue. Um, but I think overall, I feel satisfied that, you know, this is going to address um, the concerns that we expressed. And I think, yeah, you're going to have a rogue property from time to time. But what you're not going to have is this issue where builders are trying to get their CFOs and it's taking longer because they're trying to time things and the house isn't getting complete, uh, which doesn't benefit the neighbors either because they want the fences down as well. Commissioner Dubuck. So uh, just to be clear, these would be uh, kind of targets for Mr. Gillum to come back with a rough draft of amendments to the ordinance for us to consider in the full context of the ordinance, correct? Yes. That's what we're moving on? Okay. So we'll have another discussion then when that language actually comes back and we'll see how, how it feels in the context of the full ordinance. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll move for the resolution. Oh, I'm sorry. You oh. know what, Commissioner Macy, but you can move. That's fine. Commissioner Dubuck. I'll move for the resolution. Okay, is there a That's second? Fine. Second by Commissioner Perush. I'm going to yield to Commissioner Macy for okay. discussion. Okay, well, well now I think I have another question about what just happened. But, um, okay, so I was also confused about the detached structures. structures. So I think I got it now, but I'm going to repeat it back to you just so I make sure I have it right. So right now, as the ordinance stands, if I'm doing only renovations or on the home, I have to fence in the home, but I don't have to fence in the detached garage. Correct. Okay. So this, the, the whole idea behind this exemption for the detached accessory structures is that if I'm only going to do work on my garage, that I no longer am going to have to put that fence around it. Correct. Okay. Um, are there any other detached accessory structures that I'm not thinking of that are commonly, like, is there anything else big that could be, no? No. Okay. It's a fancy um, word for garage. <laughs> fancy word for garage. I'm going to park my car in my detached accessory structure when I get home. <laughs> um, okay, and then, um, and then I heard, I heard that your, your concern about porta johns and dumpsters will still be there, you know, until the end, basically. Right. I'm not concerned about them. I want you to be aware that they're going to be there because no, okay. that was one of the original criteria for this ordinance was that dumpsters and porta johns be enclosed, enclosed in inside of the fence. Okay, so um, are there other things that you're thinking about, not concerned about, but thinking about that, that we may not be that would be exposed? Like Commissioner Dubuck mentioned, maybe the siding material. Are there other things that are likely to be out there post 
uh, the insulation inspection and pre-finishing up the landscaping that we should be thinking about? Portageons, dumpsters? No, only only exterior elements are going to be stored outside at that point. Any any interior finishes, they're going to move right into the house. They okay. don't want them to get damaged. Okay, and then one, one more. Um, so for the uh, renovations and additions under 50% of the building, it still seems kind of big to me. I mean, it's, what, what's the, why why 50%? Like, what what kind of renovation is that that you're thinking that? We've had several that are small additions off of the back where they're adding small dormers and... Um, they have to enclose the house in a, in a fence because that's what the ordinance requires right now. So what if they're digging a basement as part of that and there will be a, there'll be a hole? I mean, there, there's going to be some kind of foundational hole for some point anyway, right? Like That would generally be in their backyard where they don't want anybody else to be anyway. And they'll be home. Hmm? And they'll be home. You know, It'll to monitor right. who might be, you know. Well, so, yeah. It's just a dormer. It seems a lot smaller than me than 50%. So I did 50% addition on but my house. But the way the ordinance is today, <laughs> they have to put up the fence. And what we're saying is, is that if you build a dormer, you don't have to put up a fence anymore. Because the way the original ordinance was written, it just was a construction site. So now what we're saying is, okay, if you're doing a smaller project, there's no need to bring out the big fence. Okay, unless, you're, unless you're improving your house by over 50%. I'm quibbling with the size of smaller because a 49% dormer sounds pretty big to me. It's basically what I did in my own house. So at I'm that just point, they're going to be adding it. another floor on. They're going to be generally renovating the whole house at that point. HVAC, wiring. Once you get to that point, you're, you're generally renovating the whole house. You might have an oddball case where it's a 49%, but I guarantee that's the real exception okay. in the rule. Commissioner Douglas. Just okay. a quick observation. I mean, once a dumpster and a porta john get onto a site and inside the fence, the chances are slim that they're going to move once the fence is removed. So, I mean, when we talk about, you know, intruding on the sidewalk or anything. I mean, once they're there, they're going to stay there. So we've accomplished our goal by establishing the fence in the first place. Yeah. There's a motion on the table. Any other discussion? Oh. Oh. Sorry, that was my last question. What is the motion? You were saying, Commissioner Dubico was saying what this motion it's, it's just going to direct... Yeah, the city attorney okay. to incorporate these elements in the modification so we can come back and read the ordinance. Okay. Okay. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right. We are down to item number 13, parking requ request Royal Oak Manor. Mayor, members of the commission, you do have a recommendation from the DDA uh, in regards to that request. Uh, the DDA is recommending that you do approve the request, which was to remove uh, the parking restrictions along 7th Street between Maine and Troy. Uh, the restrictions uh, don't allow parking from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, the DDA did vote and, and has forwarded that recommendation to you. If you agree with it, there's a suggested resolution in your packet. Any questions for Mr. Twing? Commissioner Macy. Uh, Mr. Ashley has spoken here quite a bit about the possibility also of, of bagging those meters. Was that discussed at all? No. Um, well, the, there's ongoing discussions on a lot of topics. This one was simply the one that was dealt with in the sense of removing the restriction to the signs. There, there hasn't been a formal request to do anything with the meters at this point. Uh, there's been no formal reaction, so I can't tell you where that's going to go. Could be passes, could be other things. Okay. And Mr. Johnson, is that something that would go to the DDA, or would it come here directly to, to bag the meters? Uh, that would eventually go through the DDA, but there would be other concerns as well. I might add that uh, we met with uh, the Royal Oak Manor management today oh, good. and discussed this in a number of a number of issues related to it. Okay. What'd they say? <laughs> uh, we discussed the HUD involvement. We discussed whether or not that's something that, that, that possibly might be changed, what HUD's requirements are that's been preventing them from spending money on parking. Mm -hmm. We got the contact information for the person at HUD that they're dealing with, uh, for which I'm going to deal with 
a staff person from our U.S. Senator uh, that we all know well uh, oh. to see if they can have any influence on that matter. Uh, we dealt with other options for parking. We dealt with the fact that a lot of those cars are parked there permanently and never move, uh, which they acknowledge. Uh, we dealt with whether they could actually build a small parking structure on the site, either the site in front or the other site that they own. Uh, the other site would be difficult because of just the available space. Uh, we dealt a little bit with the other piece of property that they've, Mr. Ashley's expressed interest in, which somebody else owns and is developing. Mm. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Levasseur. Yeah, and, and forgive me, I think you may have addressed this before, but I'm trying to recall the history of this area. My, my understanding is it wasn't always metered parking. It may have been permit parking at some point and changed some, some years ago. Are you able to provide feedback on the history here? Um, well, several years ago, there, there were no meters in various parts of town, and this was one area where there weren't meters. Uh, it was, I believe it had signs that were restricted to individuals that had passes. Uh, it went through the process of reviewing with the DDA and the commission to have the meters installed. I want to say that was back in 2006 or 7. Uh, but I think it was part of your pa earlier packet on something too. Some of the materials in there were uh, older items. Um, I will say the infrastructure committee from the DDA is meeting tomorrow evening on other topics in this area. This is the only recommendation, though, that they forward to you for consideration tonight is in regards to the two to six. With, with regard to the passes, was, was, was that something similar to what we have on Center Street just north of 11 Mile where you passes were given to people in the neighborhood and the parking was reserved solely for them? Or, or was it something different? Going from recollection, I believe it had to do with residents or adjacent property owners could buy those passes. Right. Uh, but that's just going I, I don't know for sure who was limited to. Commissioner Dubuck. Um, yeah, I think, you know, we gave direction to staff to start working with uh, the residents here to get this issue solved or provide some relief for the, the parking pinch they're feeling. This is an excellent first step. Um, I'll move for approval. Motion by Commissioner Dubuck. Second by Commissioner Perush. Discussion? Yeah, I'll just add. I mean, there's work to be done here, but this is a good step. We'll keep chipping away at it, and uh, you know, I'm glad the city manager, Mr. Mr. Ashley. I'm so sorry. I appreciate it, but uh, Robert's rules. <laughs> I can't. Afterwards, you can come up and talk to us, okay? Mr. Ashley, I'm so sorry because I got. You know what? You're out of order, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf, you're out of order. And to understand, I do get people that when they aren't afforded the same privilege, you know, I get it. So I hope you understand, and we'll talk right after this meeting. So um, we have motion on the table. Um, Commissioner Lavasser? I, I would like to move to hear Mr. Ashley's question. I'll second that. Okay. Uh, discussion? Or with no call for the vote, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, Mr. Ashley. My question is, when the... If this is passed and we can park on 7th Street on that. The question I have, if there's a snow emergency, where are we going to park? Because mm -hmm. there's no place for us to park. So I would like to have go back and tell them that in a snow emergency, you can park somewhere. If not, then when the snow emergency comes, we have seniors trying to dig the cars under out from under two and a half feet of snow possibly. So I would like to some direction from the commission, from the police department, from the infrastructure to answer that question. That's all I have. So if you could answer that and get back to me, I would much appreciate it. But that is, I hope it's passed and if it is, and there's a snow emergency, where do we go? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ashley. Thank all right, we have a motion on the table. Uh, Commissioner Dubuck? I would say, yeah, I think we've shown a willingness to continue working in good faith with these residents, and I think that's yeah. a legitimate concern that you know, we'll, we'll, work, we'll work on. Yeah, I think it's something that we have to answer. I don't know that we have an answer for you tonight, Mr. Ashley. So, um, but 
we do have a number of ideas that we're working. So that's good news, right? All right. I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. All right. So you got some parking spots now. Let's, a little short, but that's okay. Well, let's keep moving. Better than none. It's better than none, and I think you got a commitment from uh, the, the team here that we're going to keep pushing the ball, moving it forward, Mr. Ashley. Thank you very much. All right, let's see. Uh, item number 14, request for valet license agreement, 202 East 3rd Street. Uh, this item was in front of the commission previously uh, with a, a recommendation from the DDA. Uh, the city commission uh, referred it back to the DDA for further consideration uh, based on a request from the applicant uh, at your prior meeting. Um, the applicant did modify their request slightly, uh, removing one of the parking lots that was originally included and, and adding a different one in. Uh, the DDA did discuss it, went through it, through its committee level, met with the petitioner applicant, and also discuss it at their DDA board meeting. Uh, you'll see the recommendation from the Downtown Development Authority is for an approval uh, with four conditions. Um, the first one is in regards to the, the two lots that are currently being proposed continuing to be available. Um, the second one was in regards to the prior lot uh, that was proposed if it were to be used. Um, that the uh, uh, ballet operation cease immediately. The third was in regards to the signage uh, used by the valet to make it clear that it was open for uh, everyone to use and not uh, uh, Lockhart or the adjacent property interest. Uh, and the fourth one was in regards to that the two lots being proposed cannot be used as paid lots for um, other, other operations. Um, that was the DDA's recommendation to you. Uh, there is a similar resolution for your consideration. Just, a, Mr. Twain, just a couple questions. I mean, this valet um, arrangement isn't for specifically for Lockhart. It's for um, the public. Anyone who wishes to use the valet can use the valet, correct? Well, that's the intent, yes. The way the, the way the valet operation or ordinance is set up is generally the adjacent property owner has to be the applicant. Okay. Uh, so that's, I believe, why this occurred in this fashion. And I think when it comes to item number B here, number item number B, item letter B, um, it's my understanding that just from previous discussions with the fence and everything that was put up there, um, that Lockhart's actually doesn't control or the valet doesn't control that adjacent parking lot. That's sort of a lot that's owned by the building owner and used primarily for daytime parking for the office workers there. Do I have that understood correctly? That's correct, but Lockhart's doesn't control either the other two lots either. That's true. I just, I mean, I really like, I like the idea that we're, you know, during construction especially that we're taking um, some strides here to offer additional options for people. I think that city planning did a good job here uh, pulling together a, a good agreement. I think the only little bit of heartburn, I understand why we would want, why the recommendation for, for item B is in here, um, because if you, why do you need a couple or a few city spots if, in fact, you um, have, uh, um, you know, parking available there. But I'd also argue that during these... Um, especially during this construction period, it, it, I don't even know if it makes sense if they wanted to use those extra spots, those are spots that could become available now during construction, as well as, you know, I wonder if there's a safety hazard if they do want to use them back and in and out. And I think, you know, since this is being used for the overall public, I, you know, I think this is the only part of the agreement I see a little bit of um, issue with. Um, I think under normal circumstances, I'd be fully supportive of it. But I think given the fact that we're under construction, I'd like to see those spots be used even for valet. And I wouldn't want to prohibit, you know, the operator from, you know, terminating their valet agreement if all of a sudden they decided to open up that lot to handle more additional valet cars. That lot's a private lot. It's not being used at the moment right now uh, for parking. So any additional parking we can squeeze in that area during construction makes sense to me. But those are my comments I wanted to lead off with.
Mr. Douglas. Uh, Mr. Twing, what are the parking lots that they are going to be using? It, it mentions two, one of which is the one for on the northeast corner of 4th and Troy. Where's the other one, Mr. Gillen is pointing? Of this one. Okay. All right. Where's the first one? The first one is right here, 4th Street. Street Automotive, and then the second one is up here. Yeah, because there were two different descriptions of that second parking lot, and I couldn't place it. Thank you. I see Mr. Richards here. Are you representing the petitioner for this one? Uh, yes, I am. Mayor, members of the commission, uh, if I can have a few minutes to uh, explain the situation uh, from the point of view of the applicant, I would appreciate that, if that's acceptable. Uh, just for the record, my name is David Richards. My address is 415 Potawatomi in the city of Royal Oak, and I am here as an attorney, and I'm representing National Ballet, the applicant in this case. Also with me is Lorena Scafoni, the principal of uh, National Ballet. I did want to correct one uh, point. Uh, Mr. Wolf uh, talked about the fact that uh, uh, my client did not charge seniors. That is not correct. My client does not charge people with handicap stickers or hangers. So, but if seniors come in, if I want to use the service, I would have to pay. So I want to make sure we get that clear right off the bat. The city of Royal Oak has a uh, form valet parking agreement. And the first premise of that agreement says, whereas the city desires to allow valet parking services in and around the central business district, CBD, to pick up vehicles at one area designated by the city and park said vehicles at another area also designated by the city in order to alleviate parking congestion in the CBD. We propose to do exactly that by using three on-street parking places on 3rd Street next to Lockhart's uh, for the staging of this operation and using approximately 40 to 65 spaces located at two places, one at Knowles and 3rd with a capacity of 40 vehicles and another at 4th and Troy with a capacity of up to 25 vehicles. We would use those lots to park the cars using the valet service. The exact number of spots I cannot give you right now uh, as to what would be involved uh, because the 4th and Troy lot has to meet code. We're not sure if full 25 spaces will be included. Uh, we also have to tell you it's, we're, we're proposing that the service would start at 5 o'clock at night and if there's daytime parkers there uh, who stay over, there might be less than the full amount of spaces. Uh, that type of thing can occur, but my client has been in business in the city of Royal Oak. Most of you are familiar with the name uh, National Valley for over 20 years with no significant problems. Perhaps you could say no problems at all. We uh, went back and forth over Arts, Beats and Eats a few years ago, but my client has been an asset to the city of Royal Oak and has assisted with the parking issues that have occurred since the downtown uh, became very prosperous. I did want to emphasize, as uh, Mayor Fournier pointed out, uh, that this is not going to be uh, provided just for Lockhart's customers. This is going to be for anybody who shows up and wants to use valet parking. Uh, so that means it's going to benefit surrounding businesses. We have a letter of endorsement of the idea uh, from Rock on 3rd. You obviously know that Lockhart is in support of this from the materials already. Now, I don't want to try to speak for the DDA, but there, the, the conditions that they imposed uh, are, are for two purposes, as I understand it. Uh, one is they want to make sure that they get enough bang for their buck, that they get enough cars taken off of the street into the outside lots to justify losing three on-street parking places. The other thing they are concerned about, as I understood it anyway, uh, was that uh, they didn't want to... Uh, switch around and having other operations use these lots and thereby not getting the full benefit of the number of spaces that are available. And in an effort to do that, they put in the uh, various conditions. And I should mention, in order to save time, I appreciate how late it is, and I know you've been at it since 5.30 this afternoon. Uh, B and C, we're not worried about. We're not going to talk about those. But I do want to ask you to consider uh, the conditions A and D, and here's why. 
Condition A says that if either of the two lots that my client has available are lost, number one, his right to operate would be immediately suspended. And secondly, it would not be able to continue until he got an additional lot. The problem with that is we would not be able to come back and say, okay, we still have 25 places. This is still a viable operation. We could not come back and say we have 40 spaces. This is still a viable operation. You would have to, according to the language as proposed, you would have to have a second lot no matter what. Now, what I would propose would be to take out the language, an another location is submitted and approved, and substitute pending DDA review, which would mean the DDA would still have control. If we came back and we said we had 25 spaces, we've lost the 40 space lot, uh, but we think it's still viable, the DDA could say, no, it's not. You either find yourself more spaces or you can't operate. So we would still have that flexibility, but as written, it would not have that flexibility. You would have to have a second location no matter what. Condition D bans use of either lot as a paid lot which we have no problem with. I indicated to the DDA we would go along with that. That's not an issue. But it also bans any use of the lots at any time by any valet operation other than the vehicles from the Third Street location, including by National Valet. The intent here, I think, is to prevent double accounting. We want to make sure that there are, in fact, additional parking places. But the problem is that that effort is, in our opinion, counterproductive. Uh, the reason being is that it does not give us the flexibility that would allow us to provide maximum parking assistance for the downtown area. Uh, for the sake of example, uh, my client has been approached about submitting a uh, proposal to the farmer's market to provide valet parking uh, over the weekend during the daytime and has submitted a proposal for exactly that. Now. The language that's in this condition, condition D, would prevent my client from using either of those lots, notwithstanding the fact that it would not be used during those times. Uh, if it was to be used for a different day of the week, the intention of my client is that he would operate uh, latter part of the week when most people are downtown, uh, Friday, Saturday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, this is an intention, but if there was a special event on Monday or Tuesday night, uh, at only those folks from the Third Street location could use those lots, not somebody from a, another operation of my client. So the proposal I would make there is to leave in the part uh, that bans the use of either as a paid lot. We obviously understand it's not acceptable to have somebody parking cars when we're supposed to be using it for the valet service. But the rest of that condition, if we had our choice, uh, we would ask you to uh, delete the balance after the first line of condition D. Now, my client would like to uh, obviously have it as clean as possible. Uh, he's had a good record of operating the city of Royal Oak. Uh, we think the approach should be to provide flexibility at the start. If there's any issues that come up, if there's complaints about there's not enough use uh, to justify the, uh, the three spaces being lost in on-street parking, that can be uh, uh, reconsidered. Uh, my client doesn't think that'll be a problem. He thinks he'll be an asset. He's had a long history. Uh, if we allow flexibility, uh, it's going to be good for the downtown. It's going to be good for the patrons who need uh, to get to a location as easily as possible. It's going to be good for businesses where, the, where those patrons are going, and it's going to be good for the city of, of Royal Oak. So those are the reasons we're asking you to go ahead and approve of this proposal, but we are asking for some relief on conditions A and D. As I said, under A, what I'm asking for is to allow the DDA to consider uh, a new formulation if we lose one of the lots, no guarantees, but at least to consider whatever we propose, and in D, to simply say we can't have it as a paid parking lot, but delete the rest of the condition. 
Uh, Lorena Scafoni is uh, here. If you have questions about the operation or his proposal, uh, I do the best I can to assist, but those are the points that I'd ask you con to consider. Questions for Mr. Richards? Commissioner Douglas. Yes, what does happen when a valet operation's typical parking spaces are full? Uh, if they don't have any other location that's been approved, they have to stop accepting cars. And how often does that happen? Come to the microphone. Yeah, come up to the mic so we can hear you. My apologies if I cough, caught a cold during the dream group, of all things. Um, <clears throat> well, our town, our town tavern operation doesn't happen. Um, hasn't happened. Uh, our Comedy Castle operation. Comedy Castle, it's, an own, it's its own anomaly where there's large shows that produce cars. Sometimes they don't. Um, the rain, when it's raining, we get busy and we fill up. So we have to shut down. So the answer to your question is not, it hasn't been very often in the summer, but summer's a down time for us. So, but we certainly expect it with the conditions that are out there now, come the fall and the winter that are coming up. Quite honestly. Okay, thank you. Commissioner <coughs> Lavasser. This is actually for Mr. Gillum. Uh, my, my understanding of the valet agreement is that the city, or, or even the, the uh, petitioner here, would have the option of terminating it upon 24 hours of notice. Is, is that your understanding as well? I'm looking at the draft that's included in this with the commission letter. It provides for termination by the city upon 24 hours written notice in section 5. Okay, so, so the various conditions that were referenced here, A, B, C, D, I mean, we would still have the ability to terminate this on 24 hour notice, even if A, B, C, and D were not included in um, in the resolution here tonight. It, <coughs> That's correct. And, and I presume it would be a situation where the DDA would have expressed some concern, would make a recommendation to city commission, then we could make a decision. Is this a concern that uh, that we need to move forward on and terminate this agreement? Is that a fair statement? Um, I'm don't remember a, a prior valet agreement being terminated, but I would think that would be the logical process, yes. Okay. Any other comments, discussions? Commissioner Gibbs? I, um, I tend to agree with letter A, and if either one of the lots closes down, the only person who is going, or the only national valet is the only person entity that is going to be losing business if one of the lots, for whatever reason, flood or fire, who knows what it could be, happened to be closed down and that parking lot was not available to them. Um, I think shutting down the service or shutting down, eliminating, what's the word I'm looking for? Terminating the license because one lot happens to become unavailable is it, kind of silly. It doesn't, it, it's, it's counterintuitive. The only person, again, who's going to be losing is National Valet. And um, number two, if it's the same valet, or letter D, if it's the same valet operation and they're shuffling their cars, which doesn't appear to be the case very often anyways, um, it's still the same valet operation. It's still National Valet, and I, I can't see why that should be a restriction that needs to be on this one particular station in front of Lockhart's. It just, it seems counterintuitive. Well, I get the logic. I mean, if, you know, we're giving up three parking, you know, public parking spots for a valet operation, and um, all of a sudden, you know, that valet operator goes from X spots to a third of that, you know, then the city has to value, is it worth giving up three of those spots for the remaining spots. So, I mean, I think what 
I think there's some logic in what uh, our planning department is saying. However, I, I tend to like the idea, instead of it suspending it immediately, let's bring it back and talk about it and see if it still has value through the DDA. So, you know, okay, it can get on-go, it gets on the, the um, I almost said menu, because we've been at this since 5.30. <laughs> it gets on the agenda. <laughs> um, yeah, Lockhart's, I heard it, and I'm smelling barbecue right now. Um, and then, you know, there's a way to, to arbitrate that and say, you know what, actually, the, you know what, we're going to terminate it because there really isn't any value in the city. Okay, fine. But at least instead of having that automatic trigger, we can reassess it and look at it. So I think it's a fair request by the petitioner uh, in that regard. Um, Commissioner Lavasser? I'm going to make a motion. I'm going to move that. Uh, and here's my computer just jumped on me. I'm going to move that the. Commission approved the request for valet service at 202 East 3rd Street. Uh, I'm not going to include any of these conditions as set forth below because uh, I do believe we have the ability, if we do have a problem pop up, to, to revisit it at that time. I don't believe we have the need for, for that at this time. And Commissioner Lavasser, even item number C or letter C? Uh, even, even letter C. If that becomes an issue, I would expect the DDA to bring that up to us and then we could address it at that time. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Lavasser. Is there a second? I'll second that. Second by Commissioner Gibbs. Discussion? So, so I'm sorry. Commissioner Douglas. So you're striking all four of these conditions? That is correct. Yeah. Commissioner Macy. So I understand. Can I ask, is it the intent that these would not be reasons for it to be terminated? Or that these would be reasons for it to be terminated? These are not normally contained in the license agreement. If you strike them, is it is it the commission's intent that the, that these would be reasons for the DDA to come back and, or that is these are not reasons? Yeah, my my understanding, and Mr. Gilman can correct me if I'm wrong. The DDA can make recommendations to terminate this agreement for whatever reasons they may have. Uh, it could be any of these four. It could be other things. It could be because they want to reserve places for alien vehicles to, to, to land. Uh, but I, I would simply address those as it comes up, if, if they come up. I, I don't see the need for us to put these restrictions in at this time. If the DDA believes that, uh, that the uh, applicant here is not providing a quality service for the people of, of Royal Oak, we can address it at that time. Commissioner Macy. Um, so I understand your, your point in what you're saying here, but it seems like it's making the DDA to become an enforcement operation that's going to be having to pay attention to all these things instead of setting out the guidelines for what the way that we would like them to operate um, so that they know how to be within the bounds. And so if we they lose a parking lot, for instance, and instead of the DDA, DDA having to be staring, standing there peering at the parking lot, they know, okay, now we go to go back to the DDA and get... Um, get approval. I mean, I think we've heard from the peti petitioner tonight that, that B and C are fine and A and D with some modifications. I don't understand why we wouldn't proceed with A and D modified the way that they were suggested. Commissioner Dubuck? I agree. I think the DDA put in some thoughtful provisions. Uh, I, I don't see the reason to strike them, so I can't support the motion as put forward, but I'm I mean, I want to approve the contract. I just don't understand the reasoning behind oh. striking all these the, these provisions the DD, DDA thought were necessary to get to a 6-1 vote. Certainly, if someone wants to make a motion to amend my motion, they're, they're free to do so, but I've made my motion. Is there a motion to amend the motion? Seems harder. I'm just doing it again. Yeah, I mean, I think for me... Um, you know, I appreciate the petitioner coming out, and I have no objection to what they're proposing. But um, in that same vein, I, I can't, you know, just do away with all of these because the DDA, I mean, this is their proposal, right? So, and they are charged with certain responsibilities and expertise, and I don't want to eliminate all these things, especially if there's mutual agreement among the two parties to have these things um, with an appeal to us to modify language in point A and D um, because I think we have to consider what the DDA considered. They obviously discussed this item in detail and had a lot of conversation and there's wisdom behind it. I may disagree with item B, but the petitioner is not asking for anything on item B. So 
Um, I'd like to see B and C stay with a modification for A and D, so I can't support the motion, but I'd certainly vote for a motion if it was put on the table afterwards to um, uh, make the modifications that the petitioner requested. Okay. So, all right, no other discussion. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? No. 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 Okay. The motion fails. Commissioner Macy? I'd like to make a motion to approve this resolution. Um, with B and C intact and A and D modified as the petitioner suggested such that um, the, the valley operation um, I think you just said strike but I think that doesn't quite work be suspended following no pending 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 DDA pending. approval he doesn't want suspended at all during that time right the suspended <coughs> Pending DDA review is or what my notes say. Okay. Uh, and then D, um, strike after paid lot. Okay. Second. We have a second by Commissioner Lavasser. Discussion? Commissioner Gibbs? No, no, I was... Just saying hi? I was, hi. I was waving nice and saying you. no at the same time. <laughs> All right. Um, any discussion? All right. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, good luck. Thank you. Cold winter nights. <laughs> We're talking about why did we didn't do more with the sidewalk snow ordinance. <laughs> My car will arrive. <laughs> with French fries and booster seats. <laughs> Thank you. All right, this brings us to item number 15, discussion of netting at Fairways Condominium Association as requested by Commissioners Macy Dubuck and Perouche. And I will hand it over to Commissioner Dubuck oh, or Commissioner two. Macy. Or Mr. Russell. Or if you guys want to talk all at the same time. Well, you guys I'll requested just, it. I'll just tell you what you were provided. You were provided a summary of the insurance claims since 2002 that are golf related, a map showing the two areas in question from Fairways Trail. And I contacted a vendor about the installation of netting at one of the locations uh, for the golf netting. And I believe the uh, city attorney provided you a legal opinion as well. Mr. Macy. Um, so I appreciate the letter that we've received from Mr. Russell and also the opinion from Mr. Gillum. I, I also thank you very much, the Fairways Association, for this um, for the very nice presentation today about what the concern is. Um, and to me, I, again, I understand why staff has seen that this is not a major liability issue and maybe um, not in their recommendation to do it, but we look, we at the commission table are looking at this issue from a safety issue. Is this, are we providing the safety that we're required to provide for our residents? Um, and to me, this is a very minor cost to provide for a very provide against a very very major liability, and I don't mean just the liability that it's going to cost us dollars. I mean the liability that someone that a resident or a visitor to our city is going to get hurt because we were negligent. Um, in my mind, this seems to be a really easy one, and it was laid out so nicely today that I don't think I have to do much arguing for it. So, Commissioner Dubot. Uh, agreed. I appreciate staff's position on this, but um, yeah, when we did the fence ordinance, we didn't do it because a bunch of people had been getting run over at driveways. We did it because we knew it was a good safety precaution, and that was you know on twenty five thousand residential properties. So uh, this seems like a pretty reasonable risk for people to be concerned about. And given that our number one reason to exist is to you know help provide for the you know safety and well-being of, of people who live in this city. Um, I think moving forward and, and paying for this extra netting uh, is wise. Uh, so we don't have to do it after someone gets bonked in the head. I'd just like to add, we do have a fun balance. <laughs> for I, heard that. I heard that. So I I just, I'm, I'm crossing this off my Case, list. I'm FYI, down. Shot. Shot. Commissioner Levasseur. Right. Assuming that this commission wants to move forward in this direction, what type of resolution does staff want from us? in order to move to implement this. I think I'd be well, <laughs> well, I mean, what's the limits? Because I will, will tell you, regardless of the netting we put up, it will not be a 100% solution. Okay. Right, we aren't, we aren't asking you that. Well, that. It's, I mean, because cause the, the hole in question, 
Uh, number one, two, three, nine, five, I believe it is. Um, four, four. Um, you know, a lot of that is bounced over. There's a pond in front of it, as you can see on the map, and people overshoot the green uh, going. There's about 20 yards between the fence and the green. And I believe most of the balls that are hitting it are landing in the parking lot and bouncing and causing the damage. There is a bit of a net on hole number five of the part of three next to it. There is fencing that goes along. We did lose some large pine trees there that opened up part of the swimming pool, and that's part of the issue there. But if you look on the drawing by the swimming pool, you, I believe you can make out part, part of a net that's already in place. So once again, it won't be a 100% solution and there are other places on the golf course that may also have people coming back asking for netting. Okay, but, but with regard to what we're proposing or what, what we have suggested here, uh, does this address 80%, 90%, 95% of here in golf balls that might be flying in this direction? In, at this location, yes. Okay, now, now the west side is, is as, as Submitted to us, and I believe that was twenty to thirty thousand dollars. That was that was an interpolated amount. Once again, I have not had a contractor out on site. I was the numbers were got by just myself pacing it off and contact, contacting a golf netting contractor. There's nobody locally for that, so you do have to mobilize somebody from out of state for this kind of installation. Is that where there's currently a net? There's a net. There's a net on number five. I guess it's about 40 feet wide and 50, 50 to 70 feet tall. Uh, what, what I'm trying to get a sense of whether this net on the west side is, would be brand new or is either repair or replacement for that net that's already there. That would be evaluated. And that would be evaluated. It would depend on how much net we're adding on and how many poles we would need to do it. We may have to... If it's a longer stretch of net that we're putting in, we may need additional poles, and we may have to redo the whole thing. So it could, it could, it could become a close to a hundred thousand dollar project pretty fast. Commissioner Macy, I'd like to make a motion to direct staff to come back with to come back to us with the overall cost estimate for putting putting the netting up for a, for a vote by the next meeting? No, I would prefer to come back with an RFP and an award, and then you can decide whether to award it or not. Yes. That's, that's let's do that. that. That's fine. Okay, that's which important. won't happen at the next meeting. It'll happen sometime this winter, and maybe we'll install it next spring. Okay, that's a long RFP speak. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Macy. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Perush. Discussion? All right, we can't charge the bad golfers every time they hit it like 10 bucks to pay for it, can we? You know, no chance? I don't know. It's a thought. That's why I don't play golf. <laughs> I have to tell you, I've heard my brother lives on a golf course and I've heard a few broken windows and you hear those golf carts take off pretty quickly. <laughs> um, all right, I, uh, I guess we'll call for the vote. If there's no further discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. We'll have an RFP and some information back to us, and then we'll see uh, what the next steps are. So thank you again for coming out. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. I know this looks like so much fun since 5.30 p.m., but uh, we appreciate you sticking it out with us tonight. So if there's no uh, other business for the betterment of our community, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved by I'll Commissioner second Vassar, seconded by Commissioner Gibbs. Uh, any lengthy discussion on this motion? Uh, uh, motion to with amend. none. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, they say. Mr. Wolf, you're out of order. We haven't we haven't Give concluded us 30 the more meeting. Seconds. Um, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed. The motion passes. We are adjourned. <laughs>